What's up, peers, and welcome to Join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to sit down with the one and only Aviv Milner, who has been tinkering on some awesome privacy projects in the space, uh, and a general great uh, economist, philosopher, mathematician all around the board. So I'm sure it's going to be a lovely conversation about all things in the Bitcoin privacy realm. Uh, and uh, is as always, catch this episode on a podcasting 2.0 enabled uh, wallet, like for example, Breeze or Podfriend or Podverse, uh, where you can toss us some sats, not just me, but the whole team here working on the edits, that's Saxonet, uh, on the artwork, that's Yegor, and on the show notes, that's Ubuntu. Uh, so Piers, uh, uh, by the way, Aviv also has an amazing podcast, When the Music Stops, and that is, of course, and also li podcasting 2.0 enabled. Uh, so whenever you're listening, uh, toss him some sats as well. And now, without any further ado, uh, Aviv, how are you? Oh, I am. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. This is good. This is exciting. Um, I had a large coffee, so I think I think uh, I think it's gonna be fun. How are you, Max? Oh, very good. It's always a pleasure talking to you. And I think to start this out with, uh, I'm I'm always curious about like your motivational kind of origins. Like, what, when and why did you get so fascinated by that uh, cypherpunk philosophy, uh, so that you dedicate a, a huge part of your life to contributing to it? Yeah, um, definitely an interesting, serious place to start. Um, but the the motivations for the cypherpunk philosophy came from. Uh, growing up in the United States with uh, immigrant parents. So my, my, my parents came from the Soviet Union. And I grew up in the 90s and early 2000s in the United States. And a big theme that was going around was that freedom is so important. Like free speech, freedom, every, all of the good movies and the good learnings from the Second World War and the Cold War were coming forward, like the fall of communism. Uh and so for me, the big thing was always that um, fascism was bad, like totalitarianism was bad. And, and that was the, 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 the story that um, was in my mind all the time, was that fascism was bad. Uh, so uh, cy cyberpunk philosophy is very much uh, like, very much, I, I feel, uh, comes from this element where it, it's, it's about protecting your fundamental rights to speak freely and, and behave freely against a fascist government. So I think I think that's probably the best summary of why um, I go on this. I mean, there, there's a like you know you can talk a lot more about like why Bitcoin or why this or why that. But I think on on a on the kind of the highest level, that's probably why. Yeah, I tend to agree. We've we've seen quite some drastic horrors uh, in the 20th century, um, and but of course you know with. This also started with a uh, restriction of free speech, right? And then famously book burnings and, and all these types of things. Uh, now, and of course, cryptography played a massive role in the war efforts itself, right? And and then ultimately uh, uh, ending the war uh, also. So where do you see that now in, in this last 50 years since then, uh, that cryptography and, and the cypherpunk ethos has, in, has been impactful? Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting question uh so the cypherpunk movement doesn't begin or end with bitcoin this is a very important thing to realize it's it's a long long movement pgp for example is a pretty fundamental part of this movement you will notice that when you know if you go on my twitter it's my pgp key that you see first i don't talk about myself it's just you know pgp keys right there and a pgp key is uh, it, you know, it stands for pretty good privacy. I believe it was, what's his name? Phil, Phil Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Yes. Phil Zimmerman was the inventor of pretty good privacy. He named it after his uh, favorite grocery store that he liked, which was called pretty good groceries. Um, and he essentially open sourced and made free and accessible to anyone through code and through software, the ability to make your own public key and then find someone else who has a public key, key encrypt anything you want, email, audio, video against their public key, send to them. Doesn't matter how you send it. You can use Facebook, Telegram, WhatsApp. You can literally have the NSA personally grab that parcel and pass it over. And you have pretty good confidence that it's secure because um, of, you know, asymmetric cryptography. Uh, for a while there, uh, there was a funny aspect where the U.S. government wanted to make the claim that Phil Zimmerman was an arms exporter 
by making cryptography freely accessible, which is pretty funny because uh, pretty good uh, PGP is essentially just prime numbers, you know, uh, and some some other uh, mathematical properties and some rules, and that's it. So by by saying it's illegal um, is essentially saying that uh, a specific prime numbers are illegal. Um, in fact, the NSA also wanted to make certain levels of encryption illegal, which again is funny because it's, it, it is like banning multiplication of certain numbers. It's, it's, it's untenable as an idea. Um, and so where is it today? The problem today is that PGP never got fully accepted. It never really took off. People didn't see what cypherpunks from the 80s were talking about, which is that we're going to live in a panopticon where everything you do and say is recorded without even your knowledge and consent at times. And the problem is you'll forget about it. And then one day you'll wake up and there's so much on you and everything you're about to do, everything you like, everything you want to do, you don't know how that can be used against you. And then all of a sudden it's like, there's an election that happens and people make the claim, oh, Facebook is selling data about people's interests and that skewed the election. Yeah, absolutely. That could have skewed the election. Your data can skew so many things, you know, like um, how soon before, you know, uh, people can buy profiles of each other. Like, for example, for the concept of dating, where the fact that you had three girlfriends and, you know, you know, and how long you were with them is just publicly available information that will be sold to women that want to see if they want to date you, for example. Um, some people might say, oh, that's kind of an interesting or cool uh, way to live. But, um, you know, and that might be like kind of a harmless, maybe even fun, uh, you know, thing for dating, but it really opens the door to totalitarian governments. Um, and so that's the problem right now. There just simply is not enough, uh, privacy happening in the public. The best example of privacy in the public right now, in terms of people fighting for it, like front and center, I would say is iPhone. Um, in terms of like the largest company that isn't scared to say privacy matters. Um, but other than that, I don't see a lot of privacy. Yeah, that's kind of a, a weird in-between state. I mean, for, for one side, cryptography has overtaken the world, right? I mean, you use it literally every single day just when going to the internet, right? HTTPS, like everything is encrypted to an extent, right? But it seems to not be enough to just, you know, use a little bit of encryption here and there, right? If you really want to have a, a holistic privacy protection so that your choice to selectively reveal yourself to the world is actually defended and enforced by well, unbreakable mathematics, right? That's, that's a whole different thing. So we've come quite a lot, but what do you think is missing? So what's missing is there are two fundamental things that are missing. Number one, the will from the people to get privacy. And number two, a better trade-off for privacy tools. Uh, let's talk about the first, a will from the people. The problem right now is that if you give a person two options, behind door A is, um, is uh, actually quite good privacy. Quite good privacy, provable. The experts will tell you it's, it's, it's good privacy. Um, but, you know, the user experience is it's, it's okay. It's fine. Or you go behind door B, the second door, and you say, listen, we're going to strip all that privacy bullshit nonsense, and you're going to get way more likes and way more friends and way more connections. And there's way more going on over here. People just choose the second door every time. That's the problem right now, uh, is that the will is completely gone. And the will is gone for a very good reason, because no one has truly or at least not a majority of people have truly experienced the attack against you that a lack of privacy opens the door to. Like, I mean, a, a coordinated like attack against you where, you know, you find out that um, everything you've done has been sold as a pamphlet to people for the purposes of job recruiting. And, and it is out of your control now. Like the narrative of your life is completely out of your control. And, you know, everything you say to anyone, you don't know if the person talking to you already has a Wikipedia page of you that you didn't write and that you didn't even know existed. Um, this is, uh, this is, you know, w w we're already there. Like it's, it's, you know, if it wasn't for a few laws and a little bit of, of software that isn't like fully developed yet, we would be a hundred percent at that point where targeted attacks would be like $10 a person. Um, and 
uh, and 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 that's that that's a big one. So there's there's no will there. And the second thing is that um, there aren't a lot of uh, good options that strike a good balance. Part of this is to do with with the trade offs, um, but we need to see more companies actively um, say that privacy is something they want, and so they make good products with a good balance. Uh, because if you look at what PGP is. It's not the most fun to use, right? You have to have this public key. You have to like maintain it. You have to maintain the private key that's associated to it. If you lose that private key, you have to make a new public private key pair, uh, push those to various servers. Um, when you when you want to talk to someone, you have to encrypt against what, what they're doing. You have to use some sort of like intermediate software. Most people say that's too much work. So ideally, you would have like some sort of email or some sort of software that automatically does all of this for you so that you're using PGP in the background, right? And it's not like it's not Google that owns this. It's, no one has any access to it. It's really just the, the, the private keys on your hardware. And ideally, those private keys are in a secure storage. Um, but at the moment, uh, it, it seems that the technology has not really made that middle ground. And and Bitcoin is a weird like it's it's a weird microcosm of this. Like again, you have Bitcoin, which is specifically telling you we're here to undermine governments. If you want to undermine governments, you should probably do it privately. You shouldn't you shouldn't want to to expose the the who you're working with, how much you're getting paid, all of your colleagues. You don't want to expose that. And the question is how many people in Bitcoin actively pursue privacy products? And the answer is less than 10% or less than 20%. It isn't the 90% that we would expect for a space that's already a niche space of people that, that claim to have certain values. Um, so those are the two things, uh, you know, the, the, the will of the people and um, the, the tools from, from the, um, the developers. And uh, of course, you and I, I think we work on both sides. We're trying to encourage the will of the people and we're trying to help at least, you know, test and and talk about and 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 review the work of the developers. Yeah, very very great summarized, and I really like that one aspect of the network effects as well. Right, in it's it's very or currently there are just so many people in those non-private networks that the use of communicating with those people inside this network is just tremendous. Right, you can reach everyone and you know just interact. That's that's very very useful. Well, on the other hand, the privacy tools, maybe even because they are that clunky to use, uh, don't have that many users. And thus the, the use case for them as a communication network decreases, but also their privacy decreases just because anonymity loves company. And the larger the user base, the more anonymity set, the more privacy you will have. And so this is somewhat of a, of a vicious circle, right? That uh, because of the easy UX and UI, uh, the less private options become more users, which makes them a more attractive communication network, right? Compared to the more clunky UX uh, of a private and secure uh, messenger, so to say, or whatever the network is, uh, which brings it to be, uh, have a smaller network effect, right? Uh, which is sucks on the communication level, but also on the privacy level. Uh, so what do we do about it? I, you know, and that's a great that you tipped your hat. Uh, anonymity loves company is actually the title of a paper, Anonymity Loves Company Usability in the Network Effect. We read it as a group, uh, Max and I, about a year ago, maybe a little, a little bit more than a year ago. It's by Roger Dingledine and Nick Mathewson. I highly recommend anyone listening to this podcast to read it. And it's not a technical paper on privacy and encryption tools. It's a philosophical paper on approaching privacy. And one of the fundamental things that it comes away with is saying, listen, you have to make privacy simple so that everyone uses the same thing. Because if 2% of the population uses good privacy and 98% use the default setting, which is awful privacy, even those 2% might not be helped. Um, so it's a great paper. We could talk about it actually um, like at length because uh, it's such, such a great paper. You can also find it on the Wasabi Wallet YouTube, I believe. Is that right? Um, yes, there is I, a I, research club. I forget the number, but it was quite early, I think. It's quite uh, early. And, and this is like number lovely. four. Yeah, yeah. And I, I loved your presentation about it at the beginning. Uh, those were the good old days uh, where we got those prepared were, to the research calls. <laughs> those <laughs> were the good old days pre-COVID. That's the, it's like for the audience, that was like 30 years ago pre-COVID. That Before anyone listening was born, that's when uh, Max and I were uh, doing the Wasabi Research <laughs> Club. 
Um, but yeah, Roger Dingleline, funny enough, he is the, uh, the creator of the tour project. He co-founded the tour project. So this, this guy is someone who really cares about privacy and is probably one of the largest contributors to, to you know, hardcore privacy. Um, and, uh, and he writes this paper and it, it, the conclusion is just so different than what you would expect. He even starts with like a, um, a thought experiment where he's like, you know, imagine you had two systems, one called heavy crypto, one called light crypto. Here he uses crypto in the term of like encryption. Um, and he says, which would you pick if you are pro privacy? And he ends up saying that it's the light crypto that will win um, because heavy crypto will have a smaller anonymity set. Um, and uh, and so he talks about the minutia there and about, about how to make decisions. I still remember um, Adam was harassing Max uh, while during the, during my presentation, which was not open for commentary. Uh, Adam decided to harass Max and was like, because uh, there's a part in the in the um, in the paper which says it's better to have fewer features. And Adam was like, "See, Max, we need fewer features." No, no, no. Para seventy three. Sorry, no. Para seventy three was like, "See, Max, fewer features." Okay, this is for you. Stop telling us to add more features to Wasabi Wallet. <laughs> So I still remember that. Uh, yeah, he was trying to take away my job here. And I mean, <laughs> uh, my job is to make the impossible feature request. Right, yeah. So, so I, I felt very offended. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, Max, stop it with the features. And then privately, I'm like, Max, I'm going to need more features because I really like the features that you're doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's about keeping the public persona, guys. That, that's, that's what I was doing at the time. Um, but uh, but yeah, so so the, the, the question you asked before I, I sort of went back to this paper is like, what do we do about it, I think? Was that the, uh, the question? Yeah, the, uh, you know, I think that's the, the Anonymity Loss Company paper, I think also has this part in there that in this trade-off decision matrix uh, in terms of privacy, right, uh, where we also have usability and, you know, all these different parameters, key lengths, encryption algorithms and all of this, someone has to make the decision of which technology to use. The question is, who is it going to be, right? The protocol architects, they might design a perfectly private system, right? But then maybe on the implementation level, right? You can leave some of that decision-making power to the developers actually making that implementation, right? Uh, or then ultimately you could let the end user take the final decision of whether or not to be private or where to fall in this trade-off matrix. And I would I would argue that maybe as the higher up we go, right, the earlier privacy is chosen by default, um, the the better. Yeah, I I can imagine some also more complicated methods where you have like twenty percent of users are power users that select custom settings, and the eighty percent are the default is the majority setting, right? And so the 20% are essentially voting. Like if the 20% say, look, this, this level of key length is so large, it's too slow for us. So the majority of them are using like a mid-sized key length or whatever. Um, then the 80% default to that. And so like one day when the computers get stronger, the voters would say like, okay, the, the higher key length is better. And then the 80% just automatically switch. It's possible. Um, um, there, there's di di different trade-offs for sure. It's 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 a complicated question of who picks and um, yeah yeah. And we're talking here about we're not talking about encryption. We're talking about anonymity in uh, an anonymity network. And for the users to understand what that means, an anonymity network is when you have multiple participants and they're all trying to be anonymous with their behavior. This is kind of like well, it is UTXOs because again, UTXOs are public. That is Bitcoin's associated to addresses, right? UTXOs are public, but you're trying to hide in public. It's about trying to be inconspicuous at a mall, right? That's what anonymity networks are. In other words, you cannot be invisible. That's what encryption does, is makes your content invisible. You can't be invisible with Bitcoin um, because you're dealing with a public network, but you can still hide in a crowd. So that's what anonymity networks are all about. Um, exactly. And that's that's so inherent to Bitcoin, right? Because in the very early days, right, 1983, uh, we developed Xiaomi and eCash, right? Perfectly private payment system, right? Uh, perfect anonymity, right? With the anonymity set size of all users, right? Uh, with every single transaction. Beautiful, beautiful. But why did it fail? Because you could not verify what was going on and how many tokens were in existence out there. Right? And it took cryptographers and scientists 30 years, basically, to figure out the problem that is Bitcoin. 
right, to sacrifice complete anonymity, right, in favor of a public network of tokens, so to say, that can be looked at, that can be verified according to the set of rules of the full node. And, and that solves the, the trust issue in creating that digital scarcity and avoiding double spends. But of course, it needed to add then a lot of friction in terms of perfect anonymity, right? That simply does not exist in Bitcoin at that conceptual layer. Yeah, so uh, Xiaomi and eCash, again, I'm, I'm not sure how much the listeners know. I'm guessing people have heard at least of David Chaum, um, because, well, for starters, Xiaomi and CoinJoin is, is the CoinJoin protocol. Um, the Xiaomi and eCash comes from uh, the blind signing of the central bank. So this bank would have all these participants and they would send each other money and the participants um, would be able to send each other money without uh, uh, even the bank being aware of, uh, you know, of how much money is being sent to whom and all of that. And the, uh, the user can prove with, with uh, I believe it was like zero knowledge proofs that the amount that they were sending does not exceed the amount they have. Um, so like a range proof, um, I, I, I never, you know, fully studied, uh, Xiaomi and eCash. I, I know this kind of as, a, um, um, sort of in, in a high level. Um, but of course it required that you trust this central bank and that someone build this central bank and that the U S government doesn't destroy this central bank. And of course, if anyone is familiar with later in the story of the pursuit of digital money, Liberty Gold was one of these solutions that was presented. Um, and if you look up Liberty Gold uh, on Google or on um, uh, what's it called uh, and, and look at the Wikipedia, uh, you will find that uh, um, they were taken down. They were shut down. Liberty Gold uh, shut down. Uh, Liberty, Do Liberty Reserve. Yes, excuse me. Liberty Reserve was a Costa Rica-based centralized digital currency service that built itself as the oldest, safest, and most popular payment processor serving millions around the world. They were entirely shut down in 2013. Um, and this is very important because they kind of were like Chaomin eCash, right? They were like, we're centralized. We'll let you guys spend money between each other. We always have the gold behind the, the vaults, uh, or we make these special dollars. We're not the Federal Reserve, um, you know, and, uh, and the government just shut them down. And that, that, that's the problem. So what Bitcoin did was said, um, what Satoshi solved was, okay, at least we can solve digital money being available without the need of trusting third-party institutions. Um, you know, highly recommend reading the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, <laughs> just the first page is only seven pages long or whatever it is, like nine pages long, very short. The first page, Satoshi perfectly outlines. He's like, you know, we can do this and this and this and this, but we solve a problem. We, we have to trust third parties and third parties are, are you know, they, 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 have, they have problems. He wrote this in 2008. That was before Liberty Reserve got shut down, but he knew that's what would happen um, because it's common sense. Uh, the U.S. government is not going to uh, freely allow for competition. And this this has been, you know, uh, that classical well, battle in in these last years of of cypherpunk movement, right? That trusted third parties are security holes, and and you know you see that in 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 many areas. You saw that even with with encryption, right? With trusted key setups and things. Uh, that uh, are are not as favorable as complete trustless solutions, and um, and this goes further in you know Bitcoin uh, as we see here that multiple people when uh, consolidating your money to into someone else's hands that's not a good idea. Everyone remembers Mt. Gox, hopefully. <laughs> um, yeah, but it it might also extend uh, to you know centralized models of communication. Uh, and I think this is one of very interesting points to go down to how, how would it be possible to uh, censor the communication of a quote unquote trusted third party in terms of communication um, coordination? I mean, you know, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, again, uh, so the, 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 the trade-off that, so, so my favorite expression that I learned from studying cryptocurrency. So I would say in the last like five years or so, that was, um, where I sort of built this like saying is there are no solutions, only trade-offs. It's very important to admit this. If you ever hear someone that tells you they have all the answers and no downside, it's typically a scam. Um, and I don't want to say Ethereum by name, but anyways, it's typically a scam. 
uh, <clears throat> it's, you know, uh, anyways, the situation with, uh, with, with, with all of these things is that if it's decentralized and fully trustless, it will have trade-offs. As an example, Bitcoin doesn't have a leader. Doesn't. There's no, I mean, unless you think Craig Wright is, is Satoshi, um, in which case, um, you know, that's your opinion and it is wrong. But uh, if, if you don't uh, subscribe to that, then Bitcoin doesn't really have leaders. It has a few people that are kind of like senators, maybe. You know, they kind of, they talk with other senators and they kind of represent different opinions, but it doesn't have one leader. And the result is that we can't just have hard forks every two months because uh, if we do, we have factions. So, the, the, um, so you know, I'm sorry for this tangent about um, about the, the trade-offs here, but let's look at Bitcoin and remind ourselves of the war of 2017, which was the big block debate, which started in 2015, of course, but really had an apex in 2017. And now we're post that war. We can look back and say, what happened? And here, here's what happened. Uh, there was a war. Um, many of the senators of, of Bitcoin, so to speak, said, uh, you know, we shouldn't make hard forks. We should stay apolitical. We should make changes that are backwards compatible. A few said, no, we should make changes that are in the best interest and we should hard fork and change the code and people should follow and agree with us. And we called them Bitcoin Cash. Bitcoin Cash forked off. You know, we told them to go fork themselves and they did, which was great. Um, and they were like 10% of the hash power and or, or even at one point 20% of the value of a Bitcoin. So if you had one Bitcoin and then you ended up with one Bitcoin and one Bitcoin cash, Bitcoin cash was worth like 2.2 of, of a Bitcoin. And then uh, firstly, Bitcoin cash had no users, no adoption, no transactions. It, it, it plummeted. Now it's worth like 1% of a Bitcoin. So it lost 20x of its value against Bitcoin. Um, but what's more than that is that it split again. It split again with Bitcoin SV. So Bitcoin SV was like, actually, Bitcoin Cash isn't the real Bitcoin. We're the real Bitcoin. And they got super culty with Bitcoin SV. And they came out. And then that split again uh, with Bitcoin eCash. And I think eCash, Bitcoin eCash was Bitcoin Cash hard fork. But the point is, is that what you have is a community fractured because it allows people to get political. Um, so that's the downside of decentralization. So what's the uh, the downside of centralization? Well, it's less resilient. It's less resilient. So, you know, here I have a, a sort of a more personal story because I did work and I do work for a privacy software company that specialized in um, in very strong encryption tools for users and managed and maintained a um, essentially a communication network and anonymity network for individuals who wanted to communicate freely. And uh, unfortunately, um, we were essentially um, given a bit of an education in the the way that uh, specifically America um, deals with um, with privacy tools and how America couches um, you know impinging and in and, and uh, uh, diminishing uh, uh, freedoms personal freedoms basic freedoms freedom of speech freedom to be to, to speak freely, freedom to speak your mind, which means privacy, which means anonymity, which means security. Um, how America attacks these things under the guise that they are saving the world from the terrible monster of drugs. Now, obviously, no one on this podcast, Max or I, or anyone listening has ever done a drug. Um, this is this says caffeinated, but it's actually decaf. So I'm, I'm innocent. Um, but hypothetically, if we did do a drug, um, and it was great... Um, you would argue that it wouldn't make sense to put millions in prison and to destroy our personal liberties to stop the free trade of those drugs. And what you would further argue if you were an economist or a sociologist who could study um, the impact of this drug war is that you would say it appears that this disproportionate imprisoning of black people and brown people um, – isn't actually decreasing the use of drugs. What really decreases the use of drugs, and again, depending on what drug we're talking about, because caffeine is not decreased at all, um, what really decreases the use of drugs are, um, are governments acting in the best interest of the people. Um, for example, high, low unemployment and high level of education. Um, these are things that will make people say, hey, I don't want to do these 
more risky drugs because I have a lot to look forward to, but I'm still very much into these other drugs that are less risky. It turns out that marijuana doesn't kill one in four people. That's what I thought my whole life, which is why I've never done marijuana. Um, at least I can't remember if I have because of other reasons, but, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and so, um, yeah, so that's kind of my story. Now, uh, you know, I, I told Max, you know, before, and I've spoken on a previous podcast about this, um, the reason why I'm not going to talk too much in detail about the personal story is just because um, it, it it may actually hurt um, my company, you know, as it as it defends itself against uh, the United States government. Um, uh, not because I'm I'm um, ashamed uh, um, or um, or trying to lie or trying to deceive. Not at all. It's just that just that I worry that in talking on, on a wonderful podcast like this about about personal liberties and and basic human rights, this will be used against me to hurt people's ability to access basic human rights. Um, so we'll try to kind of navigate that. But yeah, that's that's roughly uh, my personal liber- uh, st- story. There is that um, I worked for a company, and in 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 a few months ago in the year tw- in this year 2021, um, the United States government uh, essentially personally attacked, uh, you know, legally uh, uh, personally attacked uh, uh, our CEO and um, and another individual, and made very large uh, accusations. And without any legal action, without any due process, we never defended ourselves, never ha- even had the opportunity. And remember, we're Canadian. I'm Canadian. This company is Canadian, totally public, like publicly available company. I'm not saying you can buy the stock because we're not that big. Uh, most companies aren't public, but um, we're very public in that you knew exactly where we were. You could go to our office. You could go and sit down with us. There's no, like, you could see the sign that says that we're our offices. We had 100 employees all on LinkedIn. You could, you could see... All of them with with a, with one Google search, you could find every person that worked there. Um, we were following the laws without any legal recourse. All the people that we worked with pulled the plug on our operations. The people that we depended on, our partners, because they were afraid of the Americans. So the Americans use essentially fear um, to push people to run away from us, and that was horrifying. And a month ago, we discovered through an affidavit. Uh, essentially through legal um, you know, documents that would be accepted in the court of law, that the Americans uh, uh, had a bigger operation, you know, Operation Save the World from Drugs, whatever they called it, like, you know, Operation America Saved Everyone, you know, the, the God Bless America operation. And in God Bless America operation, they had to take, what they had to do was they, they built a, a, um, a, a honey pot. They built a, a communication network that was completely their own creation. So they got to monitor everyone on it and they sold it to criminals, which by the way, pretty great idea, right? Like it's hard to break encryption. It's much easier to do what's called social engineering, right? So I tell you, Hey, this a- app right here, this phone, or, you know, this Bitcoin wallet, this is super secure. Yours is insecure. Quickly jump onto mine. A lot of people did that. A lot of people didn't, however, because they trusted other companies, legal companies like our own. So what did the Americans do? Did they go through due process and play within the rules? No, fuck that, right? America is number one. So they they took down our company as collateral, and they, they actually revealed that in the affidavit, that our company, um, they didn't even have... Uh, the motivation or the will, like our company was for them, it was just a, a co- like it was just a coincidence that we were there, and so they just found a way to quickly, you know, m- you know, make some allegations, shut us down. A lot of our customers, actually, not I'm not going to say a lot because these numbers I don't know. Um, it sounds like a very small number of our customers went to this other thing that was managed by the FBI. A, a lot of those pr- were, were very legitimate customers, and then the FBI went and arrested like a thousand people, of which most of them weren't from our platform. Of course, they couldn't have been because our platform was like you know something like a hundred thousand individuals, and they arrested a thousand. So the proportion of the numbers just don't add up. Um, but anyways, uh, that that that's the 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 summary there. That um, that when America fights in these wars, um, you know, th- there are no rules. And that's a little bit scary because the concept that there are no rules and that the war is more important than the rights, like we should give up our rights to win this war, is very scary. It's also very scary that the word war is appropriate here for drugs. A war on drugs is a very dangerous sentence. It, it might not be clear to everyone why that's a dangerous sentence, but when you say war, 
uh, you know, the, the expression all is fair in love and war, um, you know, that means something, right? Like, you know, it means like, you know, everything's on the table when, the, when there's war spying on your own citizen, you know, murdering a young child, right. Invading a country, like, like embargoes, like things that cost lives. That's all on the table because it's war. And, uh, the question we should ask ourselves is when is this appropriate and is it really appropriate for drugs? Is it really appropriate to, to do that for drugs? Um, but, um, and you know, I would argue, uh, it is, it is not. Uh, especially when we get things so wrong. Uh, I think a great example is marijuana. Um, uh, you know, in Canada now, it's legal across the board. So I do use marijuana a lot, uh, but only when it was legal. Before that, uh, well, I used a lot before that as well. Uh, equally, actually, before and after. Actually, less now because the weed is worse because the government is the one that's providing it. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, um, uh, I don't remember any of these things. Uh, but... Yeah, so that's what we should ask ourselves right now: is uh, is this is this just? Is this right? Uh, and what was crazy watching this whole thing come down was how the media portrayed the government as the hero in this story. And it was fascinating because when you looked at the the raw numbers of what was happening, uh, it was really hard to see them as heroes. You know, for example, just like the number of arrests, the number of money spent. The number of drugs confiscated, the kinds of drugs. The media was always talking about how the Americans said or whatever that they uh, they stopped like ten or twenty. You know, a lot of these uh, communication networks were murder for hire. But we know we know this very well that murder for hire is a super minority, absolute super minority of reasons to use private communications. Right. So, you know, uh, that's like saying Facebook is murder for hire. Right. Because, yeah, of course, there's going to be people on Facebook that talk about murdering someone else. But Facebook is mostly not that and mostly like by an overwhelming amount. Um, so unless you find like 10,000 murder for hires and you're like, holy crap, this was really great that we stopped this. Um, you know, you really shouldn't use that as an excuse to shut down a network. And, and, and that's what happened. Um, and the concern right now is that Signal is likely next. Um, Signal is a non-for-profit company that um, has an application that is, again, centralized in the fact that Signal servers are what maintain the flow of communication. And the same state that attacked our company, the state of California, God bless them, um, the greatest state ever, where everyone is leaving from right now, um, the state of California uh, is uh, requested a, sub a subpoenaed, essentially, um, Signal for the second time. I'm not following the case in the last month. So there could have been new things that I'm not aware of, but, um, you know, they're going to go after signal and it's sad. It's sad. It's scary. It's unfortunate because they're going to make the same arguments that signal helped drug dealers. Drugs are awful. And then there's also murderers and all these things. And the reality is that it's, it's just not a good reason. It's just really not a good reason. Um, so before I kind of continue on indefinitely with this rant, cause I can feel it's been a little while here. I'll let uh, I'll give it back to Max here to. Yeah, I find this such a fascinating story, right? And and it's so applicable to Bitcoin as well, and right? because we have here basically a, a service provider, so to say, right? Just a private company, you know, doing its stuff, providing a valuable service to others, um, and here it is a, a communication service, right? And well, why is it a centralized system? Well, because building things in a decentralized censorship resistant way is bloody difficult. Right? Um, I think we saw that in the Wasabi Research Club, right? Sure, we looked at all types of decentrally coordinated coin joins, but good luck. <laughs> and doing it in a centralized way is just infinitely more doable, scalable, uh, and efficient, you know? So, you know, okay, let's, let's do it in a centralized architecture uh, just because it works, right? And that's good enough. And then let's use very, very strong and sophisticated encryption to reduce the amount of information that the centralized service provider has, right? In both the coin join coordinator, as well as here in this network communication provider, right? So when you have good privacy, then selective censorship of individual's users becomes very, very difficult, right? Because, well, you don't know which of the many anonymous or pseudonymous users is actually the one that you're looking for, right? However, 
a mass and global uh, censorship is very much possible, right? You just have to shut down the entire network, right? The entire coin join coordinator, and then he's not going to provide service to anyone, right? Yeah, and, and the, no, ex exactly right, Max. I mean, and you could also, you know, put them in life in prison, you know, give them double life sentences. And now no one wants to run a coordinator because they're worried that they're going to be next. So that you know, there's a psychological war as well that's happening. Um, that could, that could happen. And in this case, it hasn't happened for Wasabi. You know, thank God, but it could happen. Uh, but, but, but go on, Max. Yeah, exactly. Right, and then this is the problem goes further up the supply chain, right? Because well, who, uh, where were the computers that ran the infrastructure for this network, right? And well, just another centralized company, right? Pro private and providing a valuable service to customers, right? Um, so again, it's much, much, much easier to have a centralized hosting provider compared to a decentralized censorship resistant hosting network. That's again, bloody difficult. And we probably haven't even yet figured it out in the first place. Right. But then again, if you have a centralized service provider that runs the computers for your centralized service provider, <laughs> then again, that is the other um, kind of choke point. Right. And it can be as easy as just, you know, cutting off your domain. Uh, because, well, everyone's at GoDaddy these days, right? And you just cancel that one number in the GoDaddy uh, database. And right? that's all of a sudden very easy to do, especially when that system is not built with privacy in mind, right? Because if it's not a private system, then targeted censorship is trivial, right? You just go in, Google the project by name and click the delete button. That's basically it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean... Uh, one of the uh, the psychological attacks against our company was that our Canadian servers uh, and all of our Canadian uh, staff and our, our company were all completely fine while this 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 uh, uh, while this uh, nonsense was was going down. But we partnered with an American company, I believe GoDaddy is an American company, and that's where we had our domain names. And so the Americans seized these domain names. And you would go and check the domain name and you would see that it, it had a wonderful uh, logo of the FBI and all the other special task forces that were, you know, jointly commissioned to take down the nefarious um, message app application. Um, and, uh, and of course, like, you know, a lot of people at, at the company uh, are not, you know, they're not cypherpunks. You know, I, I, as much as I would love for that to be the case, but a lot of the people that work alongside of me are, you know, they're JavaScript developers, they're Android developers, iOS developers, they're marketing people, which means they like to write blogs, right? Um, they're human resource department. Like there are a lot of these people and, you know, how, how would you feel if you worked for Starbucks, you woke up the next day, you know, or you worked for whatever, um, Walmart. Uh, in, in, in the corporate head office, and then you wake up and then all your things say that they were seized, you know, you know, you, you can't sleep at night. And so of course, none of the, the staff slept, uh, uh, for a while, for probably a week where people were, um, were unable to think about anything because the threat was so real. We, we honestly believe we were all going to go to prison. And it's funny now in hindsight, knowing that the Americans didn't even care. It was like, they, they're like, we're not going to pursue it. And that's the true because, um, um, because, uh, uh, yeah, they haven't, they haven't even pursued any legal action since then. So they've made allegations typically at this point, this many months into it, you'd expect them to uh, file some sort of indictment, uh, sorry, not indictment, excuse me, uh, extradition, uh, paperwork or pursue the charges further, but they're not interested. Of course they're not because it's just collateral, right? You're just the Syrian children of this story, right? Next time it'll be some other company signal will be the next version of the Syrian children in the story, right? They're just there um, uh, for blood for the proxy war, right? Because we're not, we're not, you know, you know, we're doing it for the greater good. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, it's, it's on multiple levels. And one of the other things that I find uh, actually quite scary is that uh, the FBI created this kind of fake clone of the product of this networking app, right? That, that looked exactly the same and uh, just didn't have zero of these encryption mechanisms and just sent everything in plain text to the FBI servers. Uh, and we've seen, you know, some phishing attacks of the, the scale on, on, on software levels before, right? That there are just fake graphical user interfaces that look the same, right? But have completely different magic going on under the hood. 
but to see this at this scale uh, and you know that that real is scary. Yeah, in the case, what we are talking about is the FBI fake app was called Anum. Uh, Coffeezilla is on YouTube. You can you can go and find a video about this story. Um, I'm not going to mention the name of my application, like the company I work for. Not again because I'm worried or I'm scared. You can actually quite easily find this yourself if you go on. Excuse me, if you go online, you're going to have no problem finding this story because there aren't ten stories like this. Um, but I'm doing it just just again. I don't want to give uh, something to the Americans that 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 will that will hurt uh, people uh, trying to push freedom. So I'm hoping that for the audience, they can appreciate the story without the, the specifics. But Anom is the fake FBI app. I don't believe it looked very much like our app. Um, but what, what, what's fascinating to me is that the FBI can create this fake privacy tool, go to people and say, hey, this is a really secure privacy tool. And go to criminals, right? So they, they, they went to a lot of people. But a lot of them, they purposefully wanted to give to criminals. It's interesting that 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 the government has this right to go to criminals and lie to them and give them the, these tools to help them communicate, to like spy on them. Uh, something about this is a little bit, it's a little bit weird to me. In particular, I ask myself, are there actual real journalists and real celebrities and lawyers and, and people who actually needed privacy for good reason? You know, or even a criminal who is just talking to his wife, right? He's doing a completely legitimate thing. And this communication between him and his wife is completely that that privacy is gone because of the greater good of taking down the drug war. Um, to me, this is something about this is very uh weird. And it it makes me think to myself, like, how do I know if signal isn't that? You know, how do I know if signal isn't a government created thing to spy on us? Actually, I do know it's not because Signal has open source code that you can review and a white paper that describes how they minimize what the, the, the central server knows. Um, but for other apps, um, I don't know. And it's tough because you have to do that due diligence. Um, and it's scary. We live in a world where you, know, you look for security and you don't know if who's selling it to you is a government trying to undermine your very security and privacy. This to me is like, you know, th th this is egregious. This is really agree. This is like the government selling fake guns to people that they can turn off at, at a whim, you know, uh, when they want to stop people from from rebelling against the government. It's scary because the whole point of 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 having a gun to protect yourself is that you know you're securing yourself even against a government. Um, so it's uh, yeah, the story was completely told from mostly from the perspective a few journalists did a good job and said hey guys there's actually a really big story about privacy and about what the fuck the government just did and how they hurt all these other like innocent people in this matter and how the drug war is completely lost and how all these accusations of like we you know they stopped arms and they stopped uh, murder for hire is like a super minority of what they did super minority mostly they stopped cocaine. If we're going to be like in num raw numbers, it's like marijuana, cocaine, LSD. By the way, who uses cocaine? Who uses cocaine? Fun fact, who, who, who uses cocaine? I'll tell you who uses cocaine. It's fucking six-figure salary lawyers and doctors, and it's wealthy people in these white countries that use cocaine, right? That's, that's who uses it, you know? So it's, 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 it's funny that they're you know, uh, again, if you watch Narcos, it's a great, great show about um, Pablo Escobar. Uh, it's a phenomenal show by Netflix, one of their, their best ever shows. And uh, I urge you to watch the show and then afterwards go on Wikipedia, look up cocaine export from Colombia during all that period of time to the present and the amount of cocaine sold to, um, to the world from Colombia during the heroic efforts of the Americans to murder Colombian citizens is up and to the right. The entire time, never. There's not even a blip. It's just more cocaine was sold every year. And um, did the Americans, you know, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. Th there's so much unethical shit that happens in the drug war um, that I'm just I'm not even gonna read. I'm not even gonna pursue that because if I did pursue that, my entire life would be talking about the unethical nature of the drug war. Um, so we're gonna just leave it at that. And, and, yeah, and it's yeah. always scary when when the ends justify the means, right? And that's scary on the basis of a philosophical principle. 
but it's especially scary when the ends are something as ridiculous as stopping people to eat or consume whatever they want. Right? That's just an unattainable end goal. And then if you sacrifice human freedoms and dignity in the process of striving towards that utopia, well, that's just going to fall down on its face in every possible regard. You know, dr drugs, uh, like many personal choices, uh, have good and have bad. And it is for us as people to find that line. And I, I, I'm not actually against the government imposing regulation. I think the government has a, uh, you know, this is where Max and I might disagree. I think the government has a very valuable role to steer uh, the nature of consumption, for example, of various things and to help people become better uh, by making those choices. A, a good example is cigarettes. Cigarettes in Canada and the, and uh, I think the United States as well, um, the consumption of cigarettes has gone down drastically. And a big part of it was because of education efforts where people were just told, listen, all the science is in. You just die of cancer. Like when you're like 45, you die of lung cancer. And the numbers are so radical. And not just that, if you don't die of lung cancer, you're going to have breathing problems your whole life. You're going to get overweight. Your teeth become yellow. You have all of these problems. And it's problems that weren't known in the 1920s. They just weren't known, uh, at least not that clearly. And as a result, people started smoking less and less. And then it just became uncool to smoke. And now, if you if you live where I live, which is Vancouver, Canada, if you really want to smoke a cigarette, you can. But let me tell you, it's gonna be it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard to find like like it's it's not it's not what it used to be where you could smoke in a bar, you could smoke on a plane, you could smoke at a restaurant. Now you smoke and like people are gonna give you shit for that. And it's awkward. It is much easier to be a non-smoker in a lot of places around the world than it is to be a smoker. I know Max originally spent a lot of time in Germany, so he's going to argue it's the opposite. Or, uh, and, and by the way, Germany, they smoke different than Americans because a German teenage girl will confidently roll her own cigarette on a, tr on a crowded train, right? I've seen this when while I was in walking. Germany. While walking and doing her makeup. And you watch it and you're like, this is, this is cool. She's cool. So I'm going to exclude the Germans when I talk about <laughs> smoking being not cool. But in, in Canada, um, that's what happened. And, and that's great. But notice how we didn't have to put black and brown people in prison to achieve the aim of reducing smoking. All we had to do was be honest about what smoking really does, uh, present that in, a, in, a, in, a, in an honest way. And again, it's important. South Park did a great episode about this. America actually did a lot of dishonest stuff when it came to anti-smoking campaigns. There were a few actors, not American government, but uh, political actors um, uh, who made smoking to be this like evil, disgusting thing, this terrible thing. And it was funny because South Park was actually pro-smoking in that in one of those one, one of the episodes because they pointed out that smoking cigarettes is still a choice. It's still part of the American way. It's like, yes, it causes cancer. Yes, it's risky. Yes, it's not whatever, but I'm sorry. Uh, so does skydiving and rock climbing and alcohol and too much caffeine and, and premarital sex and, and, um, and everything else. Like there's so many things that are risky and that we do. And we accept that life isn't just about perfectly mitigating every risk and being Mormon. Um, unless of course you're Mormon, in which case that's exactly what life is about. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Um, and it's all uh, about individuals having the choice of which risks to take and which not to take. And, right? uh, because well, again, risks are some perceived individual subjective, uh, thing, you know, some people are more courageous to venture into risky activities than others. And, you know, that's great. That's the beauty of division of labor. Those people who are reckless can be reckless and they're usually going to find some really beautiful things out there in the unknown. And then they can bring it back and tell the less courageous people of how it was in the underworld and what cool insights they have found. Exactly. Um, you can still look at the big picture and say, okay, we have this culture that's pro-smoking and smoking really hurts. It also has addictive properties. But at the same time, I, I really don't want to live in a society that, that, that makes smoking impossible. I don't. And I also don't want to uh, say the bullshit line that people say, which is that smoking is only bad. It's not only bad. I'm sorry. Now I'm going to come off as a cigarette commercial, but I've had quite a few cigarettes in my day. I vowed to put that 
to rest. Again, I, it's not that I regret every cigarette that I've smoked. I've had like the sensation of smoking a cigarette after an incredible, some, some sort of incredible experience. And, you know, like, like, you know, wearing a leather jacket and you had an amazing conversation. I don't know if I would give that up. Like, I think that that makes my life more interesting and colorful, right? I'm choosing now not to smoke anymore just because of finding a balance. Maybe I should choose also in my life not to drink any more of this fucking caffeine that ruins my sleep and that causes me to be irritable and, and anxious all the time. You know, I'm finding that balance for myself, but this idea that it's only bad is also extremely dishonest. And this is what I hate the most about the drug war, which is this dishonesty that cocaine is only bad. Really? Is that the case? Cocaine is only bad? No one's ever had a good time on cocaine or marijuana or LSD or mushrooms or, um, you know, any of these, like it's only bad. It's kind of, it's kind of strange because when you say those lies, um, they become obviously lies to people who've tried those things and then been responsible with them. Uh, famously, uh, Car Carl Hart, I believe is his name. He's the gentleman who works for, uh, he was at one point, uh, the head of uh, research for drug use in America, American psychologist, and uh, he's Department of Psychology at Columbia, and he is professor. He, he Hart is known for his research in drug abuse and drug addiction. Hart is one of the first tenured African American professors of science at Columbia University, um, and he later worked for several like public um, departments with oversight. And he explicitly said. Uh, that he used heroin recreationally several times. And people look at that and they're like, holy crap, this guy is insane. What does he mean heroin recreationally? And that's exactly what he meant. He meant uh, here, uh, in 2021, Hart published Drug Use for Grownups, Chasing Liberty in the Land of Fear. What a great title for a book on Actually, drugs. Actually, now I want to read it. <laughs> Drug Use for Grownups, Chasing Liberty in the Land of Fear. Wow. Okay. I'm, I got to buy that now. Uh, this, this, this podcast just became a sponsorship for this, <laughs> <laughs> for this, this, but we didn't know, but we, this is unplanned or maybe it was planned. Who knows? In the book's prologue, he acknowledges that he personally uses heroin for recreational purposes. And again, there's never a mention by the, by the government or the media that there is such a thing as responsible use of things. There is such a thing as a responsible use of caffeine. I am not an example of that. But you will meet people who are an example of responsible use of caffeine. And just because you look at me and say, let's ban caffeine, not, 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 I wouldn't disagree with you. I think I'm a good example of why we should ban caffeine. Don't undermine the liberty of those who know how to use caffeine well. And don't undermine my ability to find where that is, that healthy middle ground of using caffeine well. Man, I like to talk. <laughs> well, that's, that's why we're doing the podcast. And yeah. You know, I'm, I'm curious with, with our previous conversations about uh, trusted third parties and security holes, right? And how, how this now ties in with having a trusted third party to, to uh, tell you what and what not to put into your body. Um, I, I think there's one more way that we could get this back into the blockchain space, uh, which is phenomenal. Right? Uh, with the current trusted third party uh, that, that, that you see as, as this massive systematic threat. Sorry, trusted third party that I see... Um... What's the hint there? Uh, are, uh, are, are you talking about Tether here? Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I, I need more caffeine. Uh, drugs will solve my problems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's fine. It's from Starbucks. It's legal. Yeah. So trusted third parties. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, if we take a look at the cryptocurrency space um, and the Bitcoin space, again, we see these uh, these areas where trade-offs had to be made. One of the trade-offs is that Bitcoin isn't stable compared to something like the US dollar. And um, uh, an important thing to realize there is that, you know, with the US dollar, uh, whatever bad things you can say about it, one thing you can't say that's, that, that, you know, that's bad about it is that it is predictable. In about a year, I know roughly what I can, what I can spend and all that. And with Bitcoin, there's a lot more volatility there because there is a speculative as, uh, aspect to it and it's in its early days. And um, the hype in the media goes up and down in a, in a non like predictable well, organic way. It's very like, you know, large spikes and then like huge lulls. Um, so we need dollars in, in, in the system if we want to trade against Bitcoin. And the problem here is that, um, if you use real dollars, you have to fall within the regular regulatory framework, 
which is fine. But this is where you have like a Canadian exchange that can only allow Canadians and an American exchange that can only allow Americans. Um, and, and, uh, and there's all this KYC and AML. And so here came Tether. And Tether in 2013, 2012, I believe, released a white paper and said something that at the time they were likely doing with the best of intent intentions. So the Tether story is a f phenomenal and interesting saga on um, there. Um, and it's what I spend a lot of my time doing now is, is thinking and talking about that. But Tether said, look, we're going to make a token and it'll, it'll be a placeholder for the U.S. dollar so that all the people of the cryptocurrency ecosystem can still get access to the U.S. dollar as though it were like a Bitcoin, because a Bitcoin is free to all people. If you have the internet, you can have a Bitcoin, right? You just call someone or talk to someone online that has Bitcoin, buy it from them, do something from them, work for them, you get the Bitcoin, it's yours. No one can stop that from you. That's amazing. What if we had the same thing for U.S. dollars? Well, we're going to build that for you. We're going to build something that looks a lot like a poker chip. So you're going to go on uh, uh, to us, you're going to give us some real dollars, and we're going to make this token, this U.S. dollar token, and this U.S. dollar token you can send on the Bitcoin blockchain, right? I know that p uh, people from the Ethereum camp tell you that Bitcoin can't have smart contracts or anything else, but that's not true. Um, there are tokens on Bitcoin network, um, and uh, one of the first tokens was Tether on the Omni protocol. And so, uh, you know, Tether at the time uh, was incredible because it allowed people to create like exchanges that were purely code, no bank accounts, nothing offshore. And you would have these Tether casino chip tokens and Bitcoins and people could go there freely without any KYC AML and trade and do all of these things and not worry that the U.S. government, um, you know, that, that someone had their passport or their identification. The problem was that the ability to print money solely on the... Uh, on the promise that they're going to be honest, as we know, is a recipe for disaster. It's, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a huge recipe for disaster. And if we look at what happened with Tether, um, where we are now is a very unfortunate and very scary place. So so a, a story that this sounded good and started off well, he, here's where we are now. Tether is the number three cryptocurrency by market capitalization with a total of 62.5 billion units, which means... The Tether company, if you remember from, from the inception of Tether, alleges, uh, at least one point, that they should have $62.5 billion US dollars in reserves. Turns out they don't have that money. And they admitted it several times. And now, in fact, they claim that they don't have it in dollars anymore. It's only 3% is actually held in dollars. 10% if you slightly expand what it means to hold something in dollars and you include T-bills and other very secure reserves. At most, we're looking at 10% of their reserves are in dollars. There has not been a verified quality audit from Tether, the company, for years if if not i'm not sure if it ever came out but i know for a fact hasn't been for a while they printed something like 40 billion dollars in 2021 40 billion they're responsible for 60 to 80 percent of trading in the cryptocurrency ecosystem and almost every offshore unregulated exchange depends entirely on the fact that this coin will remain stable and that what is happening isn't a gigantic fraud and unfortunately and this i'm saying this in, in, in I'm, I'm using the word unfortunately as literally as I can. This is incredibly sad. Um, unfortunately, they are likely a gigantic um, scam. And, and, and it makes sense why, right? They're, the company itself is registered offshore. Uh, it is not an American company. It's not a company in any jurisdiction that has clear rules. Um, you know, the company... Uh, um, has uh, the New York Attorney General filed um, a suit against them, uh, which concluded with them being banned from the state of New York, um, and um, uh, because of what they did in it in a 2017 2018 period, where they essentially had no backing of the Tether token, uh, and at that time there was about a billion units of Tether. They had no backing of the Tether token for about nine months period. Um, all of these facts, I highly recommend you guys check out. Um, I'm not going to say my podcast. I think a better thing is Bennett Tomlin and Cass Pianci. Those are two people that really outline what's going on with the Tether um, situation. And they're both very pro-crypto. Um, they're just anti-Tether. Um, but that's the situation we are right now, where the single Tether token, the single company, which has 13 employees, which is the only record for more money 
per employee in the history of the world is Bernie Madoff's company. And if you don't know who Bernie Madoff is, he ran the lar- one of the largest hedge funds in the world. And from the years of 19, roughly 85 to 2008, he did not own a single stock. So it was a Ponzi scheme. And when I say Ponzi scheme, what I specifically mean is that money from uh, uh, money being paid out of this hedge fund was only coming from new investors. And that at the end of the day, when too much money was being pulled out in December of 2008, he came forward and said, that's it. I'm done. I'm out. There's nothing there. And people said, what do you mean there's nothing there? He's like, yeah, I never, I never had a single stock. I never had a single thing. There's nothing back there. And then vanished you know, billions of dollars. I think at that time it was like $60 billion uh, scam or fraud just vanished to thin, thin air. So many lost their money. Um, so Tether is a huge risk. It's a huge systemic risk. And it's important that Bitcoin maximalists, cypherpunks, serious people um, talk about it because um, it's not to say I hate Bitcoin. You know, like I understand why someone like Peter Schiff is going to be happy and excited to talk about Tether, but I'm not Peter Schiff. I don't, I never really listen to him and I don't particularly agree with a lot of what he says. Um, I'm not Peter Schiff. Uh, I'm pro Bitcoin, but I'm, I'm concerned. I'm deeply concerned about what Tether is doing. And I'm concerned that, you know, if, 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 if I could convince every person, you know, in the cryptocurrency space, I would just say boycott every exchange that accepts Tether. And that deals in Tether. And if everyone did that, they would collapse on their own and the cryptocurrency space would move on. But unfortunately, people care so much about Binance. Binance is the largest criminal um, exchange right now, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's doing so many illegal things and all their bank accounts are getting shut down left and right. People are, are pretty terrified right now that Binance is going to, it's just, the, you know, CZ is going to prison for a very long time and cryptocurrency space is going to take a large hit for it but but binance is almost entirely backed by tether like they have billions and billions i think it's like 20 30 billion dollars of tether is all in binance so there's this two gigantic elephants in the room and they have a disproportionate impact on the cryptocurrency space which as your listeners already know has been so corrupt by bullshit of like doge and shiba and you know ethereum and cardano and just so many like just bad ideas uh, and people, you know, misguidedly running headfirst into into dumb ideas, um, but you know, you know, Binance and Tether unfortunately represent a much too large part of the crypto space because the majority of crypto space is not people that listen to this podcast. That's what's really an, uh, upsetting. It's not cypherpunks because if it was, Binance would not be that big, and that's what sucks, you know. Yeah, I find this a fascinating <sighs> topic, and I mean, so so convoluted, right? And so many um, like speculations. But l- let's look at it at you know at a first principle standpoint. Like, you know, first of all, you have base money, right? That's not a claim from anyone else to anyone else, right? It's an actual asset. It's the actual money proper, right? Like the gold coin in your hand. When it's in your hand, it's not in someone else's hand, right? It that's base money. And that's Bitcoin, right? You when you hold a UTXO then nobody else has the right or the ability to spend that UTXO, right? It's it's a claim. It's it's not a claim on money. It's money proper, right? Same. And so in the fiat system, there are two base money types, right? There's physical cash, right? That's not an obligation against anyone. That's just physical cash. And then there are central bank reserve, right? So this is basically the assets that the central bank holds on their balance sheet. These are the, the two base money assets in the fiat system. Now, when you talk about your classical bank account, right, what happens is is that you take your physical cash, your base money, and you put it into that vault of the bank account, right? And the bank now issues to you a money substitute or a money certificate, right? It's a token in your online banking, you know, spreadsheet or whatever they use um, that says that whoever has this digital token, right, can redeem it at par for base money in the vaults, right? That's a that's how the, the the leveraged banking system basically works, right? You have claims on the underlying base money, and then you can have a claim on the claim of money, right? That's M2, and a claim on the claim of the claim of the money, right? That turns into M3, 
But here, of course, the more people have a claim on something else, the more you have trusted third parties and the more, obviously, they are security risks. Right? Now, what is then basically Tether? Right? If it would be that you could put in your physical cash into the Tether corporation and in exchange get your uh, Tether token, then that would be a money substitute. Right? And if you could redeem that Tether token and receive physical cash, and then it might even be redeemable at par for that base money, right? But the way that it works in reality, right, is that it's not even base money being backed here, right? It's some, only a very small percentage of what is in the vaults is actual physical base money. Then other things are high security claims on money already, right, like some government bonds. But then the majority is claims on the money, on the money of some corporation, in, in some convoluted debt uh, scheme. So it's it seems to me that as a money warehousing facility, which Tether somewhat strived out to be in the first place, it's just failing on that front that there's not enough base money backing the actual money certificate that is issued by Tether. Absolutely. And, you know, it's so complicated and difficult to talk about these things because we have to talk about how banks work and how all these other things work. A lot of what you're saying you know, um, like with banks, there's this worry of a run on the bank, right? Because a bank gets a dollar, they lend that dollar out to someone, that person then puts that dollar in a bank, that bank then lends it out. And we, you know, there's like an unwinding and a, there's an expansion and an unwinding process where there's like um, the, 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 the money, um, according to uh, all of the checking accounts and bank accounts is much larger. It's 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 like M M zero M one M two money supplies. You, you you know you guys can look this up. It gets very much much larger um, uh, when 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 banks are dealing in, in fractional reserve. But what's important to understand with Tether is that Tether is not a bank. Tether is not a bank that follows very strict banking regulations. And to be clear, I'm not saying banks don't commit crime. Banks commit crimes all the time. Like the the you know, just look up Wells Fargo crimes, look up HSBC crimes, crimes left and right. And I'm not even talking about small crimes. I'm talking about fucking helping the you know Mexican drug cartel, like money laundering for the Mexican drug cartel crimes. Totally, you know, all, all those bankers can go fuck themselves. But th they are doing those those crimes. But at least they're like front and center, and they have those regulations. Tether is akin to a Las Vegas casino. Right when you go to a Las Vegas casino, you want to know that when you gave that guy a hundred dollars and he gave you a hundred dollars in chips, he's not going to take the hundred dollars and spend it to like make the casino better, and then say like, oh yeah, it's fine. I'm just going to keep making giving people chips, and you know it's fine as long as people stay in the casino and no one leaves, it'll be fine. Like no, with casino chips, it is not a bank, which is why uh, there are strict regulations. If you go to, I've been to Las Vegas. Uh, mostly for rock climbing. But if you go to a Las Vegas casino, um, you'll notice that there are so many strict regulations about how casinos run. You know, so many cameras, all these things, every dollar is accounted for. You know, you don't, you, otherwise you would constantly hear about casinos imploding on themselves as people exit the casino and there's not enough money to pay out um, those casino chips. Um, Tether is like a casino, but it's a casino that lives in the least regulated place in the world. And it has an amount of money that no one casino could even fathom of having, right? Like, just imagine if, if, if you walked into a casino and you said, hey, how many, like, poker chips are currently outstanding in your casino? And if they told you even $50 million, you would ha you, your mind would be blown away. Like, you're telling me there's $50 million of outstanding chips? Well, Tether has $62.5 billion. That's uh, 62000 Five hundred million dollars of outstanding casino chips, and they're admitting it's fractional reserve. And this is the big thing. So, it is in my interest to find out that Tether, this entire story, is just fud. I would love to wake up tomorrow, and uh, this is very important for, for for people to understand when it comes to good skepticism. I would love to wake up tomorrow and see the be best, cleanest audit from a well-respected accounting company in the United States that says, "Hey, look." Tether has all the money in reserves. You know, maybe it's not all in cash. It's in T-bills. It's in commercial paper. It's in all these things. But the commercial paper is solid. The T-bills are from the United States. Uh, you know, uh, the precious metals are limited. You know, um, 
it's it's quite safe. Like, you know, we're not going to lie here. It's, it's you know, they more, more or less have $62.5 billion. I would love to say, guys, crisis averted. There's no problem. Like, there are other problems in crypto, but this, this massive elephant in the room, totally fine. But that's not what's happening, unfortunately. And all the evidence is in the other direction. And it's so insanely in the other direction that, you know, we're looking at what looks like currently the largest Ponzi scheme or example of fraud in history. The largest, right? We're not, we're not, not in America, not in Canada. I'm saying in the world, it's, it's, it's getting, it's, 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 it's hall of fame level of fraud here. Um, and it affects so much of the cryptocurrency community, not people directly listening to this podcast. Because if you're listening to this podcast, I know you don't have Tether. Obviously, don't don't reach out to me saying, I don't even hold Tether. Obviously, I've never held Tether. Max has never even fucking thought of holding Tether. That's the, Obviously, that's not the point. But the point is that what happens when Tether is shut down, like Liberty Reserve was shut down, and when 15 of the major offshore exchanges go bust overnight. Binance goes bust overnight and half the people that I know in Canada that are excited about crypto literally lose everything. Is that is that an exciting thing for the Bitcoin space to have everyone lose everything? I don't think so. You know, I personally wouldn't lose everything, but I would not be happy about this. And I, and I, I do worry for my fellow man in this case, and I don't want the, the, the reputation of this space to be tarnished and forever remembered as just another Bernie Madoff incident. Um, and that's what's happening right now. And so part of this podcast is, is this tricky business of talking to Bitcoiners and saying, look, I'm, I'm also a Bitcoiner, right? I'm, Max and I work together. We were at Bitcoin, Breaking Bitcoin 2019 in Amsterdam, which was amazing. Um, but we have to be get real about this and we can't bury our heads in the sand. And we need, we need to think about how we're going to deal with the elephant in the room. Um, so how yeah, is this different to Mount Gox? Ooh, great question. Mount Gox has happened many times. In other words, exchanges go bankrupt, famously in Canada. I, I, I don't know what it is, but as polite as people say Canadians are, we've had a lot of scammers in this country in crypto. Um, but uh, Quadriga famously evaporated when the, uh, the, the head of Quadriga, um, Gerald Cotton, there's a wonderful piece on the radio you can follow. It's, it's called A Death in Crypto Land. Check it out. It's a wonderful piece about Gerald Cotton. He uh, allegedly went off to India and uh, died from a very preventable illness that he knew in advance that he had, um, that he could have easily prepared for. So, so there's a lot of red flags there. He also went to a country notoriously known for um, giving birth uh, death certificates, excuse me, death certificates to people who buy them. And Quadriga, you know, vanished. It was a Ponzi scheme in that they took money from uh, Bitcoiners and people who wanted to buy cryptocurrencies, and they showed balances online on the Quadriga online web uh, website. And then one day, everything was pulled, and it turns out everyone's balances were faked. And the Bitcoin that was allegedly part of Quadriga was long gone before the exchange went insolvent, which means it was a Ponzi well before it collapsed, just like Bernie Madoff was a Ponzi well before it collapsed. Collapsed. Now, that was big news in Canada, but the reality is it's just one exchange and there are so many. So what makes Tether different is that Tether is the bread and butter. It's the gasoline. It's the, it's the, um, it's the pillar that holds not one exchange, but... 50. And we're talking about the largest exchange. What's the largest exchange right now? Well, you know, it's Binance. Binance Smart Chain. I mean, whenever something is called smart, you know, it's stupid. Um, but anyways, the Binance Smart Chain, which is just, you know, um, you know, uh, CZ is, is, is manually signing all the blocks himself. And it's, it's the most centralized garbage with the stupid NFTs on it. Binance is the biggest example. They would, they would just implode immediately. Um, if Tether collapsed. And then it just goes, like you just go down all the list. You look at the top exchanges, you're going to get six out of 10 or like seven out of 10 of the top 100 exchanges are Tether, mostly Tether backed exchanges. Um, and if not Tether, the next biggest uh, uh, um, token, I believe is the Binance token. Um, yeah, Binance USD is third after USDC. And Binance USD has a similar problem in that it's run by Binance, which would also collapse because of Tether. So, you know, 
so many exchanges would collapse at the same time. So what we're talking about, we're not talking about a single bad thing. We're talking about a black swan event where, you know, everything collapses all at once. This is like a recession in that, you know, it's normal for a company to fail, but when all companies fail at the same time, that's a recession. Um, and that's what fundamentally makes it, makes it so different and such a concern. It's that it's, it's a systemic risk. It's, it's everywhere. But where is the difference to other massive shit coins, you know, like EOS or Cardano? I mean, they are traded on all these exchanges too, and they could go to zero as well within a second. Another wonderful question. Um, um, so EOS um, was created by serial scammer and liar piece of shit, Dan Larimer. Um, I, I don't even care. If you want to sue me for libel and defamation, Come at me. I, I'll, I'll take you to court. I can back up the fact that you're a piece of shit. Um, so Dan Larimer, he raised a little bit of money for his startup. You know, when you're in college and you're like, man, I have this great idea. You know, Max and I, we had this great idea. We just need a little bit of money to make this idea possible. You know what, Max? I think we could make this idea work if only we had four billion dollars <laughs> this little idea here we could we could do a proof of concept which of course failed um eos raised four billion dollars which just it's painful to, to 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 say that out loud that's um, that's a good series a it's a good series a <laughs> i mean this is for a company that didn't have a product yet right this is pre their stupid dumb centralized blockchain um they raised four billion dollars, and of course, Dan courageously handed over the 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 reins back to the community, um, and is deciding to go elsewhere after two years or three years. Dude, you had four billion dollars, and you're calling it quits after two or three years. God, I like I I fucking hate that guy with a passion. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of shit coins. The problem is that EOS isn't sy systemic. E um. For one, there's not a lot happening on EOS, but for, for another reason, it's not that every exchange is mostly trading things against EOS, right? There are only a few systemic things. The systemic things in this space are as follows. Bitcoin, number one, most important thing. Um, it's the, it's, it's the purpose. It's the reason it's the alpha of the space. It's the beginning. Ethereum is quickly getting a small, you know, a, a, a sizable second place. Uh, the the Binance Smart Chain really quickly uh, jumped up there. And Tether, there aren't that many things that are like really systemic, like just everywhere that have ton of volume and that have ton of trading pairs. You know, thankfully EOS never became uh, that important. So it's really just a matter of how systemic it is. Um, um, you mentioned another scam. What was the one you specifically mentioned? You said EOS or... I think you it's might have probably, said Cardano. It, it, it's gone bust already. So <laughs> yeah, but anyways, uh, yeah, th that that's that's the difference. It's the difference between um, something that is fundamentally holding and maintaining all of these offshore exchanges, and something that's just one. You know, EOS is a single slot machine, or even a handful of slot machines at a casino. But Tether is the chips. If all the chips explode or evaporate in your hands as you're playing, the entire casino collapses. If the slot machine is shit and people hate it, they don't like the EO slot machine anymore, it's okay. Like the, the casino will simply focus on other games. Um, but Tether is, is, is so fundamental uh, to, to everything uh, right now. And what's worse is that people aren't consenting to Tether. That's the, the, big, the big thing people don't talk about. No one is going around saying like, guys, I'm so stoked about Tether technology. I'm really uh, bullish on Tether. No one says that. No one even, but, but, but why is it number three without any of this like following in this community? Well, it's number three because your idiot friends that uh, tried to buy Doge on Binance, when they did that, they didn't know that they were actually dealing with tethers the entire time when they take a long position or a short position or they get a synthetic asset or they um sell some doge temporarily and, and are holding a dollar balance that's all tethers that's tethers are the thing that makes that legitimate especially now when binance had all of its bank accounts shut down canada no more withdrawals to banks europe no more withdrawals uh america it was never illegal for them to work in the united states so now all they have is tether, um, and that's that's the problem. People aren't even consenting. A lot of these offshore exchanges don't even have the decency to tell you it's tether. They just say, yeah, it's a US dollar. It's a US dollar.
it's fine. It's just U.S. dollars. Sorry, wh wh where are the U.S. dollars? Like, can I? Can you send them to my bank account? Um, I mean, we can send you some like tethers. Oh, so they're they're not U.S. dollars? No, they're not. That's the problem. Is that tethers are ubiquitous? Offshore exchanges are the 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 go to thing. Um, why? Because a lot of people right now in the cryptocurrency space, maybe not now because it's been you know two months of decline, but a lot of people who entered the cryptocurrency space, as your listeners know, are idiots buying stupid things. Dogecoin is stupid. Uh, let's just take a moment to talk about Dogecoin. Uh, Jackson Palmer, the creator of Dogecoin, is coming out on Twitter and on podcasts begging people, please don't buy Dogecoin. It is not going to beat Bitcoin. It is not a good idea. You're not going to make money. It is a gigantic meme, shitcoin, stock, whatever, Ponzi, right? Please don't do it. And he, he can't even convince people because idiot Elon Musk, who great guy from the perspective of like stopping climate change, but please stop committing securities fraud and insider trading by pumping Dogecoin. Stop talking about Dogecoin. I mean, oof, I... Don't buy Dogecoin. Please don't buy Dogecoin. Like, it was funny at a, at, a, at a point. The whole point was you're supposed to send people Doge ironically as a joke when they said something funny on the internet. You weren't supposed to mortgage your house and, and buy Dogecoin. And Dogecoin is number nine right now, just wow. below USD coin, you know? Number nine, right? And of course, Sheeb token comes out, which is like insane. It's, 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 it's a scam that just jumped on the dog meme bandwagon, right? They just took the moniker of being another dog meme. Like, you know, it's a Shiba Inu. They're number 29. And briefly, they pumped a lot. And of course, tons of people lost their money. Where could you do all of this insanity? I'll tell you where you can do it. You can do it on offshore unregulated exchanges with 100x leverage, aka Binance. This space, unfortunately, has a cancer in it. It's not Bitcoin. It's not Wasabi. It's not privacy tools. It's not Schnorr signatures. It's fucking Binance and Tether and these shit coins and people like Elon Musk who don't realize how absolutely ridiculous it is to, you know, like the stuff Elon was saying, never have I felt smarter than the wealthiest person in the world than when I saw Elon Musk tweet about how to improve Dogecoin to make it better than Bitcoin. I've never felt so superior. <laughs> You see, it's, it's funny, it's a spice, right? That when you understand the topic and then someone else says something really, really stupid about the topic, you wonder how stupid that person is in other areas of your life where that guy sounded smart before. I worry that what happened to Elon Musk is what happened to Trump, which is he figured out that when he says things on Twitter, he gets a lot of attention to the point that he makes news headlines. And that is a turn on. Like, it's amazing. Like, if you could tweet and... Fox News and CNN are going to talk about that. Large news outlets are going to talk about what you just said four hours from now. That's a lot of power. And I get that. I get that. But it's awful the way this power was abused. And it just makes a mockery of public discourse. You know, um, by the way, if this was a comedy podcast, which it could be, but I don't think it particularly is because it's more of educational focused, we would go to the Dogecoin um, GitHub. On the day that Elon Musk recommended his uh, his nine year old followers, new nine year old followers, to um, um, to uh, make uh, to contribute to Dogecoin on the GitHub, and every contribution on the Dogecoin GitHub was so funny. Uh, you will laugh because uh, what happened was about a thousand. Uh, uh, like merge requests, uh, pull requests, um, and issues were mentioned. All of them were politely closed by the actual single maintainer of the Dogecoin. Because, you know, Dogecoin is just Bitcoin, right? They just take downstream of what is added to Bitcoin because there's no, no serious cryptographer is, is, is deeply considering how to help Dogecoin. Um, and every single uh, improvement was so hilarious, so hilarious. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find them now, but they range from like, Hey, make Tesla mine Dogecoin, you know, like, like, hear me out. What if every Tesla mine Dogecoin so that the more you drive, the less you pay for Tesla, 
<laughs> and it was just like every, like it was clearly 10 year olds who never used GitHub in their life. Um, you know, it was, it was the, um, an incredible mockery, very upsetting. Um, yeah, very, very upsetting. Um, um, let's see. Yeah. But you know, is like, I mean, that's, that's just in general, a lot of fun, right? And on the internet, you're going to have a lot of fun. It's just that now on the internet, you can also have unique tokens that are apparently valuable. But is that even a bad thing that people still, you know, just have a bunch of fun? Yeah, it's fun, except for the fact that people are actually losing a lot of money. And like, that's the problem is that Ponzi schemes aren't, aren't a great way to have fun. Ha like have fun. <laughs> like just go to a casino. Like honestly, go to a casino. Like have like have a drink, you know, play within your means. But Ponzi schemes, they have this problem where people try to actually make money and so they lose way more than they can afford to. The lack of regulation means that you have kids losing money. Wealth simple, which is the largest um, you know, it's kind of like a Robin Hood of Canada just announced. You know, they were, they were always like, oh, we're a get rich slow scheme. We're here to help you invest the right way with low fees. They announced we're going to help you. Dogecoin is now available. Um, and, uh, and I can't believe it. This is a company that alleges to be simp to be, to be honest and to like help people. When would a person seriously put money in Doge? You know, again, it's like, if you tell me, oh, Aviv, I put $5 in Dogecoin and then I sent it ironically to the Jamaican bobsled team. I'm like, that's hilarious. Great investment. Good job. That was a really well done. Like you sent $5 in Dogecoin to uh, the Jamaican bobsled team. Like that's the best meme per dollar I've ever heard. But if you tell <laughs> me you spent $10,000 so that you could pay for your daughter to go to college when Dogecoin quadruples, I, I, get, I get depressed. You know, that's what happens. I, ju I just feel like so bummed out to hear that. And that's what happens. And Wealth Simple, you're complicit in this. You're fucking complicit by by adding Dogecoin. You know better than to do that. You Any financial advisor would tell you, don't do it. Like, why? Why are you doing this? Why? You have Bitcoin. Fuck it. You have Ethereum. Like, fine. Why add Doge? Because they hear the children are talking about it. It's getting a lot of traction in the memes. And Elon Musk is tweeting about it. And we need to grow the company. So if we add Doge, we're going to get a lot of people in here. Okay. I think I, I think this is just you know the the difference between thinking of this technology as a security stock asset and a monetary network, right? Or as a monetary technology per se. Because if you think that this is just the new iteration of stocks, then sure, listing as many tokens as possible and just earning your money by swapping in between them is a great business model. And, then, and ultimately, a stock exchange shouldn't really censor that much about like what type of assets are being traded, just based that he thinks it's a stupid investment. Right? I mean, that's why we have a marketplace so that individuals can buy and sell freely what what they want to. Right? It's just a shame that this technology was set out to solve money, right? and money could not be more different than from a security investment. And and kind of that convoluting of the narrative leads to a lot of odd conclusions that's a great point so uh that's the crux of my distaste of crypto right now is that it is a high yield investment um and what where max and i agree is that if if we're doing anything useful in bitcoin it's that we're helping make a money that will work an online digital cash private secure, no third parties, works anywhere. You want to support journalists t telling Putin to go fuck himself? Let's do it. You want to support Ed Edward Snowden as he pays for server space to, to get uh, uh, American um, war crimes and human rights violations public? Let's do it. We need a digital cash, right? We're not here to triple our money. We're here because, um, because uh, in society, we need a plan B. And we're building that plan B. And plan A is great until it's not. And then that, that, that's when you need plan B. The narrative now of investment, it's so ubiquitous in crypto um, to the point where Hex, let's just take Hex, right? I'm, I'm bummed out talking about this, but let's take Hex. So 
Hex recently pumped to number four on the list of cryptocurrencies, at least on coinpaprika.com. You're not going to see it on CoinMarketCap because for some reason, they, even they think that Hex is too scammy to list. But it rose 4,131% this year. It's like 15 cents right now. Um, Hex is just a Ponzi scheme. Richard Hart is just a serial scammer. Um, you know, that's all he is. And he is hiding behind the Howey test. He's just trying to not say anything that's going to get him in prison. But Hex does nothing. You go on Hex and, and, and you read and it's hilarious what it says because it's like, you know, Hex is built to go up in price. What does it do? It goes up. What does it have? Pumpamentals. The fundamentals of pumping. It goes up and never goes down. Well, right now it's going down a little bit. We'll see how that works out for him. But this is awful. The fact that Hex is number four, the fact that Hex allegedly has some market cap of $42 billion. Do you understand how big that number is? Like, just for context for the listeners, companies, the top 300 companies in the world, some, some of those at the bottom of the list don't have a market cap of $42 billion. Let me repeat that again. Top 300, the number 300 company, top companies by market cap. When you get to the third hundred one, it'll be less than Hex Token. And these are companies you know very well because they're so uh, you know, groundbreaking in terms of what they offer to people. Um, and I think I, I slightly exaggerated here. I'm, I just checked check the numbers and it turns out it's top 400. Um, but eBay is number 399. And it's currently at a $46.5 billion net worth. And yesterday, Hex was worth more than eBay. Spotify is number 397 at $46.5 billion as well. And Hex was bigger than that yesterday. Um, let's talk about a couple other ones that, that, that Hex is bigger than. Vodafone, I'm sure you've heard about that. Nordia Bank, I think that's like the largest bank in Finland. The largest, one of the largest banks in Finland. Again, Hex was larger than that uh, yesterday. Won't be larger than that for long, um, but it was. Roblox, I'm not sure if that's the game. Uh, Chipotle, Mexican Grill, Pinterest, Samsung, SDI, uh, you know, uh, Philips, Carrier, Ross, Stores, all of these pl things you've heard of, you've used, you, you know what they're talking about, right? Like uh, EA, has anyone ever played a game before? Well, yeah, EA made it, okay? They're worth $5 billion less than Hex is right now right? So the problem with the stock market analogy is that at least the stock market has laws and like overt Ponzi's need to be stopped. By the way, as it turns out, you might ask, well, wait a second. If Bernie Madoff was running a Ponzi in 1985 and it lasts until 2008, aren't you contradicting yourself that the legitimate stock market doesn't have these Ponzi schemes? And yes, I am contradicting myself because legitimate market is run by uh, the government and the government is shit at, at, at enacting regulation. And the SEC is complicit in letting Bernie Madoff get away with what he did. And, and, and whistleblowers came forward in 2001 with hard evidence that he was running a Ponzi and the SEC did nothing. And it sucks. And I, 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 I hate the fact that I have to rely on government to get help. And then this is how they fucking do their job. But, you know, at least there's less fraud in cryptocurrency. It's just in, unbearable. The amount of just stupid Ponzi's that are, that are that are is, running yeah is is this maybe one of the conclusions or you know logical outcomes of having private and censorship resistant technologies this is the double edged sword this is the double edged sword of having free digital money is that we should expect fraud and scams the problem right now is that government is actually pushing these scams forward and not pushing back against them that's what's so offensive to me is that it's like it's the fact that government is actually complicit in helping and allowing these these people to get away with it uh robin hood wealth simple these people should be investigated immediately by the government like what do you mean you added dogecoin tell me tell me about dogecoin tell me why you think it's good to have canadian citizens invested in something that the creator of the token has begged people to stop because it's a funny meme is that why? Because hilarious, you know, like, um, yeah, it is an unfortunate aspect. So one thing that I hope that Max and I and, and others can do is some self-regulation. 
So, and this is where we as free individuals take a stand and say, fuck Binance, fuck Dogecoin, you know, all of these things are scams and we will not support, we will not be complicit in these scams. We're going to call them scams. We're going to repeat their scams. When someone comes to us and says, we want to partner with you, uh, we're going to say, hey, do you support scams? The answer is no. This is why, by the way, big shout out to the greatest crypto exchange in the universe, Bull Bitcoin. That's right. Francis uh, of Bull Bitcoin, number one exchange. Why is he the number one exchange? Um, it's not just because he's a handsome man. Uh, let's not, I hope, I, I better get fucking money for this podcast, but it's not just because he's a handsome man. It's also because he's Bitcoin only. He's no bullshit. He cares about privacy and anonymity. He will fucking die uh, defending your privacy rights. He will die defending your privacy rights uh, in front of the government. He's fighting for your rights and he's not, you know, he's not going to add Dogecoin because he thinks it's stupid and he doesn't want to hurt people. And that's, and that's Francis for you. Um, and so that's the reality is that we have to stand up and say like, we're just not going to, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to, I'm, I'm not going to shake hands with a, with a Doge pumper, you know, and, and pretend like they're not complicit because they are, um, you know, in, in, in the scam. Yeah. Fascinating world. What we, wild beast have we created here in cyberspace? It's quite crazy. It's, it's a bit, it's, it's definitely unfortunate. I, I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's the Max and I, I think we definitely lived the classic story where it's like, you know, young kids wanted to change the world and built a Frankenstein. And now we're kind of like, Ooh, this is not exactly what we envisioned, but we're trying to make it better and, and, and still worthwhile. And to be clear, my hope is that once the next Mt. Gox happens, which is the tether collapse, we're still going to have products and we're still going to try to improve the money, um, the last resort money of the future, the, the, the plan B of the future, the secure digital cash um, of the internet. I'm hoping that it won't be so bad as to destroy our ability to work in the space. Um, but yeah, right now we have to, we, we, we have to con confront this, um, as maximalists, especially as Bitcoin maximalists, we should, we should be repulsed by tether nonstop. Um, and anyone who cooperates with them. I still think that this is somewhat of a, an obvious outcome that the fiat system has everywhere. And we just see the malinvestment and overconsumption that hyperinflating fiat causes in this new economy of cyberspace. And we might see it here much more so because it is novel, because of the information asymmetry, right? And, and all these concepts that make it just a very pumpable asset, right? But I would hope that after we have gotten rid of fiat and after this is hyperinflated and we actually do have a sound economy based on a hard monetary standard that these types of over investments in casino tokens are hopefully going to be reduced so i i'm still thinking that this is not the flaw of the system that we've built per se but it's fundamentally a flaw of the fiat hyperinflation and it just manifests in an extremely volatile market uh, here in the tiny uh, rescue boat, basically. Yes. Just to be clear, when all the people lose the money and if you put a microphone to me and say, Aviv, who is responsible? I would say every government is responsible for the damage incurred by their own people because government has a responsibility to teach people about financial literacy. The fact that so many governments fell prey to this bullshit and said dumb things like, oh yeah, here we, we at the Federal Reserve actually are really, really excited about blockchain. We're going to try to use blockchain for, for our government. It's total garbage, total bullshit. And it's just another excuse for, for scammers to raise funds for their dumb projects. Um, but you know, actually, how uh, are CBDCs in context of Tether? Are they going to fix the problem or make it worse? Um, what do you mean by CBDCs? Central bank digital currencies. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, central bank digital currencies. Um, again, the problem with Tether is that we don't have proof of reserves. If a central bank makes, firstly, central banks already have digital currencies. Like I'm currently using the Canadian dollar through my bank account. I don't use cash that often. So when I e-transfer someone 
my question to you is, why is a cryptocurrency Canadian dollar better than that? That's what, what I'm confused about, right? The reason why Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency and on a blockchain is to not have third parties. Once you accept that there are third parties um, and that it's, it's you know, government enforced, blockchain seems to... It's, it seems like you're going in the opposite direction. Like you're, you're, you're taking on trade-offs you really don't need to take on. So it's silly. Um, central bank digital currencies are a dumb idea. And they're a dumb idea because they don't help the people or the government. They really don't help the government at all. Like the government wants to spy on its people, but it doesn't want other people to spy on its people. Like it wants total control of its own people. It doesn't want – like the Chinese government – isn't going to want to use a public blockchain to make its digital yuan because that would mean the Americans can very easily spy on the Chinese people. What the Chinese government wants, which is probably what it's doing now, is to use this WeChat, WeChat Pay, where everyone has a social identity on these platforms, these social media apps, and their bank accounts are tied to it. And the government can subpoena and knock on the doors of every company and collect all the data. And the moment you say something bad about communism, uh-oh, WeChat logged you out, can't log back in, all your money is frozen, all your social media accounts are blocked, no one wants to talk to you because your social credit rating is really, really bad, social scores is, is plummeted instantly. We're going to make you disappear, all virtually, but that's what matters, right? So why? Who specifically wants this blockchain to make a central bank digital currency? To me, this is just the government saying, hey, everyone. We don't understand blockchain, so this is our first meeting of the we don't understand blockchain meeting. Um, let's talk about how Bitcoin is bad, but blockchain is good. Great. Well, well, I, I agree with with the point that the technical blockchain solution is completely wrong, but uh, for this use case, but per se, I think it's still interesting because uh, you said that you you use a digital fiat currency right now, but. It's not base money that you're using in digital form, right? You're using a claim on base money in digital form. The the only base money here is physical cash, right? So not digital. There is a digital component to the, the base money, but it's not your bank account. It's the bank account at the central reserve, right? So you are you're using a digital money M1 or something, right? While what a DB CBDC encourages would be a digital account at the central bank directly, right? So that right. I think is the difference. And here again, the benefit would be that there is no longer a company that ha that holds your M M0 and gives you all the M1 paper substitutes like Tether, right? But instead you have a digital representation of the actual base monetary asset itself. Very interesting. Uh, I see, I see what you're saying there. Very interesting, but I will say, um, I don't know too much in incredibly much about finance, although I'm learning an insane amount these last few months, but I will say that even if you had an M, so even if you took every dollar bill, like I, in Canada, we don't have $1 bills. We have $5 bills. So when we go to strip clubs, we have to throw like loonies and toonies, like one and $2 coins at strippers. It's a huge human rights problem we have in Canada. We've been dealing with it for years. <laughs> um, but we have $5 bills. And let's say you tell me, okay, this $5 bill now is like a token like Bitcoin, right? So you can have a wallet, like a Bitcoin wallet, just like cash. There's no association of your identity, right? When I hold cash, the fact that I have the cash is the fact that I hold the cash. The fact that I gave you the cash is the fact that you have the cash and I gave it to you. It's called a bearer instrument. So you tell me, oh, we're going to make a digital online bearer instrument. Okay, sounds like Bitcoin, very exciting. Um uh, so Aviv, what are you going to do with this? I would probably tell you that I, along with many people, number one, would not hold a lot of cash. I don't hold a lot of cash. Cash is not a particularly smart thing to hold. It doesn't appreciate, doesn't do any work for you. Um, it slowly depreciates in value. What I hold are stocks and bonds. What I hold um, are uh, accounts with banks, I would probably take that digital bearer instrument from the central bank and I would still go to my local bank and say, can you take this from me so that I can use your services? You go and loan that out to someone else. I'll make some interest on it. But more importantly, I'm not even going to hold that much cash. I just want to have accounts with you so that I can pay off my credit card, so that I can do e-transfer, so that I can... Um, uh, buy stocks and bonds, get a mortgage later, like all of these financial things. Um, uh, it's kind of why people don't use cash that much today. Like 
um, it's not because of its physical aspect. The digital aspect is interesting, no doubt, for sure interesting. Um, but um, I still think majority of people would not hold a lot of cash. Well, I, you know, cash as having no counterparty risk, as being the bearer instrument, I think is quite useful if you don't yet know what you want to invest in, right? Or what you want For to sure. eat tomorrow. Right? Oh, For that removal 100%. of uneasiness of no, what cash, to buy in the future. Cash is the best thing if you don't know what you want to do and you're talking about a one, two, one day, two day, three day, one week, one month, even three month time frame. Cash is phenomenal. 100% the best. There's nothing better. You, you know, the next best thing is like treasury bills, but those still require that you sell them and that you open accounts and do all this stuff to get cash when you need it, right? So the reality is the best possible thing for having value that you can quickly use to get anything else is cash for certain. But then the question is, well, are you a teenager whose net worth is $84 or are you an adult with a job where your net worth is probably in the tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars? In which case, why would you hold more than $1,000 of cash, $2,000 of cash? Um, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's unnecessary. Um, so quickly as you get older and older, as you develop more wealth, and again, uh, like for context, the average Canadian family is like $75,000 a year. Okay. Canadian dollars. Sorry. Not real money. It's monopoly. We have like colorful money. It smells like maple syrup. This is why no one takes it seriously at the UN because our fucking money is like monopoly money. But anyways, um, the average Canadian household is $75,000. The average household holding cash, it's probably like a thousand, two thousand dollars maybe like, uh, at any given time. So that is the proportion we're talking about. It's very, very small. Um, Canadian households are going to have a house, which means debt in the form of cash, cash they owe, not cash they hold, a car, which is an asset, but also debt on that car, uh, education, an asset, but also debt on that education, uh, stocks, bonds, retirement savings, RSP, TFSA, all those things, tax-free savings account, all those things, almost none of them are cash, not at least cash held by the family. Yeah, uh, but I would say that we see that low savings rate of cash mainly because, well, the cash is hyperinflating and nobody wants to hold it for a long time. Right? And that's again why, why I think that we see so many investments in the shitcoins, especially when they're denominated in US dollars with Tether, right? that uh, it's just you know better to gamble a bit on shitcoins rather than slowly see your cash hyperinflating. Right? I'm so curious how this will end out being played when we have truly reached a hyper Bitcoinized world and we are now on a sound monetary standard. Because, you know, many of the pure Bitcoiners who have already switched their own mindset to sound money, they're not gambling with shitcoins. And right? so I'm curious when and if that will fulfill on the macro level too. So here I want to push back uh, on something. Um, and this brings up uh, Matthew Ranger. Who, who is a master's degree in economics from, from uh, Canada, who I spoke to recently. Let's talk about hyperinflation. So for starters, uh, um, and this is something that I've, I've learned, allegedly learned, which means that I could be wrong. I could have been misinformed, but I've allegedly learned. Hyperinflation and inflation are two different concepts. Inflation is a product of monetary policy, typically. Um, so you know, printing bonds, printing money, quantitative easing, quantitative tightening, you know, um, growth in GDP. Hyperinflation, as Matthew Ranger puts it, is a phenomenon of political, like psychology, where people like just lose faith in the government entirely. It's not so much to do with like, like central banks per, per se. And there's some w weird, interesting cases there. Um, so typically, like the central banks will print tons of money, people will lose, completely lose faith. There's, it's a whole mix of things. Um, I don't believe that any mainstream fiat currency, and when I say mainstream, I mean euros, US dollars, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars. Let's just take those four. I don't see hyperinflation there. I want to define the term clearly. Hyperinflation is, you know, if we're talking Weimar Germany, we're talking about the complete unpredictability of the cost of a good as little as a week from today. So if I ask you, What's, what's a jug of milk in Canada? The answer is five Canadian dollars. What is it going to be in a week? I can tell you, I can make a bet. It's going to be five Canadian dollars. 
Like that's, it's just what's going to be. I can even probably make that bet for six months from now. Now, of course, there are some interesting uh, outlier cases where some common goods fluctuate. Good example is gas, which we saw was negative in price during COVID. That was crazy. We didn't know that uh, uh, West Texas crude oil could be negative in price, but it was briefly negative. Um, Look at lumber. Lumber quadrupled in price recently and then dumped back to its original pre-COVID prices. Right. But lumber is everything. Everything you you're around is built by lumber. So like houses and everything like that. Um, but more or less, when we talk about a lot of things, um, hyperinflation is is not something that I see. Now, the argument that Max might make and, and that a lot of listeners might intuit is, well, listen, Weimar Germany didn't intuit hyperinflation. They didn't see it right away. In fact, the central bank, the, the, the government of Weimar Germany agreed to unmanageable amounts of debt to the winning parties of World War I, namely England and France, agreed to uh, unrealistic things that they could never pay back, only through money printing could they pay it back. Like, like 22 million Bitcoin? Yeah, exactly. Like the, the, it, it, it was the amount of money that no amount of – there just wasn't the wealth there. And they made that promise and – Despite that promise, hyperinflation didn't happen for two years. There was a weird period that historians call the, uh, like kind of like they call it, I think they call it like the the curious stability period of the of the German Reichmark, um, because hyperinflation didn't happen. So it wasn't like central bank, you know, printed a ton of money then hyperinflation. It was there was a delay there. There was still some faith or something or other. Um, and it's it's fascinating. So someone might say, well, Aviv, just because right now the U.S. dollar isn't hyperinflating doesn't mean in a month it can't hyperinflate. And that is entirely correct. You are entirely correct about that. However, one thing I will point out to you right now, and I didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago, is that um, there is a way to gamble and bet on what you believe inflation will be like over the next 10 years. And you can do this with, with what's called the tips spread. And I'm just going to pull this up here. Um, so Fred is Fred is the um, uh, what does Fred stand for? Oh, I'm so stupid. Uh, federal Economic uh, F- Federal Reserve Economic Data. Yes, Federal Reserve Economic Data. Uh, uh, Fred. St. Louis Fed. Org. If you just type in Fred online, you're going to get there right away. If you type in Fred Tips Spread T I P S Spread, what you get is you get um, essentially there's what's called um, treasury inflation protected securities called TIPS. And then there's the current bonds. And again, I'm not smart enough to fully explain this the correct way, but what this this spread is showing you is it's showing you what all the money predicts inflation will be like over 10 years, the 10-year break-even inflation rate. And currently, the expected 10-year inflation rate of the U.S. dollar is 2.33%. It hit a peak of 2.51% or 2.54% on May 12th of 2021. It hit a a local minima at 0.5% on Black Thursday, March 19th, Thursday, March 19th, when the economy took a massive dip during COVID um, because people thought the massive dip would cause a deflationary spiral. Um, But... This is interesting because what this essentially is saying is that billions of dollars are betting on the fact that the likely level of inflation is quite manageable and reasonable. And if you look at this tip spread chart for the last few years, it hovers around, you know, between 1% and 2% and 2.5%. So it's quite manageable and quite, quite reasonable. Um, um, Of course, if, if, you know, so this chart only goes to 2003 and there was a period in 2008 when the recession was so bad that there was a deflationary spiral that was presented, almost a 0% inflation rate, like neg- negative uh, interest rates potentially. Um, but currently, um, from 2003 until the present, it's been most of the time between 1% and 2.5%, um, which is quite, quite stable. So I guess, yeah, I guess there, Max, I'm just trying to push back a little bit on this idea that we're expecting a hyper- hyperinflation um, event. Again, I don't think this is proof. I think this is just like a good guess. Um, but I'm a little bit skeptical now of, of, of the extent to which we will see hyperinflation. 
You know, I'm a classical economist and I love my definitions in the classical light. And inflation is just an increase of the money supply. And base money supply is skyrocketing at unheard of rates. And when you have a, a global monetary base increase of 35% in 2021, uh, sorry, in 2020, in a single year, well, then that's, you know, a bit drastic. And uh, getting into hyperinflating territory on a monetary base layer, right? The consequences of that, including a decrease of the purchasing power of all the shit coins, uh, is, is for sure in the making. And yes, that's unpredictable when it will hit in because, well, subjective values are unpredictable by definition. Right? But the beautiful thing is what we can verify is the money supply, and that's inflating like crazy. So let, let's do a thought experiment here, Max, because um, um, this is very interesting. I think, you know, I think you've studied economics more. I, I think we have an equal fascination towards macroeconomics because it's so like important um, in the world. Um, but let's do a thought experiment. So let's, let's pretend like there's a civilization and it has a hundred people living in it. And let's pretend like there's a million dollars of M zero money supply that is just part of this civilization of a hundred people. Right. And so what that means is that you take a million dollars, you divide it by a hundred. Um, what is that? It's about $10,000 per person. And so someone works very, very hard. He accumulates 30,000. Someone else decides to buy a bunch of things and maybe slack off and go on a vacation. He has only a few thousand dollars, but that's what there is. There's a million dollars of money supply. So, so far, this is pretty simple world that I'm constructing here. Now, what happens if the population of this country grows from a hundred people to 200 people, um, but we keep the money supply exactly the same? Would you say that there's no inflation? Uh, um, there, there is no increase of the money supply. So no. Now, what happens Perfect. to price levels is a different question, right? Excellent. And, and here, what happens with, to price levels? With 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 higher demand, um, obviously the the price of goods increases, right? Um, with higher demand, obviously the um. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the price of money increases, right? So oh, if yeah, we yeah, have yeah, more exactly, people who exactly. like money, the, the yes. price of money increases. And the price of money is the inverse of all the prices Correct. in the economy, meaning Correct. the general so price level tends to decrease. We have what's called a deflationary money. We have an event where uh, there are more and more people, but the money supply is the same. And so what happens is that before, when $1 bought you one bagel, now... 50 cents will buy you one bagel because there's just more productivity. There's more people. The technology is getting better, but the money supply is the same. If you have $1 buys you one bagel, but your society is two, three, four, five times more productive, um, it doesn't make sense, right? You, 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 uh, this, the, the, this, this, this sort of these thought experiments can also be kind of con confusing because I'm confusing myself here. But um, the, the, the idea here is that all assets, all, all non-money um, becomes less valuable in money terms and holding money makes a lot of sense. Um, and this is, as it turns out, a lot of economists point out that this is actually a very bad thing to happen. And a good example that some economists will bring up is what happened in Japan, uh, the lost decade of productivity, where there was deflationary spiral and deflation didn't do what a lot of people thought it might do, which is like encourage saving and uh, in increase growth. If anything, it did the opposite. Um, it decreased productivity drastically. Um, and so the argument for money is that like cash itself, like hard physical M M0 money supply cash isn't something that you want to hold on to for a while. What you want to have in your life are assets, right? A, a, a diploma, an education, a car, a house, a uh, car is a liability. House can also be a liability. Education can also be a liability. But hopefully what you have are assets, stocks and bonds that represent actual productivity, specifically stocks. Um, those are what you want to have. Holding cash um, doesn't make a particular lot of sense from the macroeconomist perspective. Now, this is a philosophy. I'm not saying every macroeconomist is going to tell you this. And maybe Max does not necessarily agree. But that's why... The U.S. government, as an example, the U.S. Federal Reserve tries to shoot for a 2% inflation rate because 2% inflation means you still very much can predict what your cash is worth in a month, two months, three months, which is almost the same. In a year, it's worth just a, t a hair less. 
Um, but there's obviously no incentive to hold on to it. Um, uh, of course, like, don't get me wrong. I'm also concerned about the fact that people just spend till they, they're completely over leveraged and everyone is in debt and credit card and this and that. And sure, I'll buy a quarter million dollar education in social justice, liberal arts, lesbian dance theory. I mean, for that, that seems like a good investment. Everyone's buying everything. And maybe that's part of why shit coins are getting all this attention is because there's too much money um, readily, easily being available. And people don't know where to find value in society. Maybe it'd be better if they could find value in more stable things. But instead, it's, you know, extremely speculative stocks. And and, and then, of course, shit coins and Ponzi tokens and uh, pump and dump penny stocks. So it's a, it's a tough one. Um, it is. But one thing that we're for sure, the gambling will continue. Uh, and the music will keep playing. It's just a question of what happens when the music stops. Right? And that as another shout out to your awesome podcast, which actually dives into the topic of Tether uh, quite a, a lot deeper and, and also other areas that uh, I found fascinating to to listen to your great interview style too. You actually come very much contrary to me, uh, prepared with solid questions <laughs> and and a nice, uh, you know, uh, way of, of getting good information out of the guests, uh, which I very much appreciate as well. Um, but I think this is, is a case anything... of, uh, of, of self-critical behavior because when I listen to your podcast, I always think that you're doing a way better job than I'm doing. Um, I think, yeah, we're just very critical of ourselves um, when it comes to this. But honestly, like I, I, I every podcast I do, I, I, I feel that I talk too much, didn't ask enough of good questions and didn't get what I wanted out of the guest. And I, yeah. And so um, I, I, I did genuinely th think you were doing uh, a better job than I was. I thought a lot of actually other podcasters were doing a better job than I was, which I think says that there's a little bit to be said about self-critical nature that we, we, uh, we can be very, um, critical of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good thing, right? Yeah, you want to make sure that you're not up in the clouds and, uh, papastrulating stuff. That's just, um, the fluff and bullshit, right? So you want to critique yourself and to strive to be better. Right. But you know, on the other hand, good to acknowledge when something's actually good. And well, your podcast is one of the things that's actually good. That's why I can recommend it wholeheartedly. Awesome. And uh, and yeah, and just to, to wrap this up and um, and I'll kind of say uh, one final, um, ho hopefully unifying thing. And that is an open invitation to every Bitcoin maximalist. Um, and I'm talking to, and you know, if, if you are a shit corner, if you know a shit corner, if you know someone who engages in scams, you know, the first episode of my podcast is called um, Discussing um, uh, the Binance Bubble with a Shitcoin Millionaire, because it's a, it's a young kid who, 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 who gets involved in pump and dumps and makes a million dollars out of almost nothing. And he describes with, with horror what's going on in Binance and just the complete total insanity and how awful it is. And despite making money, he's just, he wants to kill himself. It's, it's, it's really tragic. Um, especially in the conversations with, I had with him that weren't recorded. Um, it was clear that he was devastated, um, by, uh, what, 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 uh, what he witnessed, but I'm going to reach out to every Bitcoiner listening, uh, and every shitcoiner and, and ask you to, um, uh, if you're a shitcoiner, uh, uh, to think critically and consider doing the right thing and, and, and putting all of that to bed and, and, and focusing on the, the niche part of Bitcoin that makes sense, which is the wasabi uh, stuff and the privacy aspect and, and, and not waste your time. Uh, for the Bitcoin maximalists and, and, the, and, the, and the cypherpunks, I would encourage you to think deeply about the level of harm that cryptocurrency is currently causing, not... Wasabi. Wasabi is not causing this harm. Not Bitcoin privacy research, but all of the shit coins, all of this harm. And ask yourself a very valuable question, which is, um, is it okay to stand idly by as friends and family and other people uh, get tied up in this, in this nonsense? And at what point do we have a moral and ethical obligation to stand up and say, enough is enough. We're not, uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this is awful. Um, do the right thing take a stand. Do not push, I would say, any cryptocurrency as investment at this point, with no exception, even Bitcoin. Do not tell people that Bitcoin is a 
good investment. If you want to say it's a last resort money, if you want to say it's a, a secure online digital e-cash, that is a, a good and safe alternative um, when you cannot trust your local government or when you want to support someone in something that a government opposes, that's one thing. But dissuade people from investing because the amount of suffering and pain is very high right now. We're talking about billions of dollars being lost in a very short amount of time. And when the music stops, um, and I was told not to not to keep saying that um, all the time, but when this party, you know, settles down, when the cops show up, it's not going to be that fun. And we, Max and I, and a lot of pro Bitcoin privacy people are going to get a lot of heat as though we're part of this group of idiots that are running um, these shitcoin altcoins. Um, and we're not, and it's important that neither are you. So um, that's that's all I can implore you. Do the right thing. Uh, talk about Tether openly. Do not support Tether. Support bull Bitcoin. If you're going to support an exchange, support one that cares about the actual things that matter. Privacy, autonomy, uh, self-custody, um, uh, Bitcoin, not other things. Um, read more about Tether. Bennett F. Tomlin. Dot com is, is, is Bennett's blog. He's very clear about the Tether fraud. He's a pro Bitcoin guy. He's been in Bitcoin for a long time. Cass Pianci, he's got a Medium article. Uh, me, medium article. He's also on Protoss.com uh, writing stuff about Tether. Uh, my podcast, When the Music Stops. Um, by talking about the problem in our community, we make our community better. That's that's the, you know, if, if only I could actually say things in a succinct and short way then um, that, wouldn't that be great? But I can't. So uh, this rambling ends with that, which is that we we as a group can make our community better. We don't have to stoop to the level of what's, what's happening. Um, and I'm so happy that I come not from a Peter Schiff, you know, outsider perspective, but I come from people like Max Hillebrand, um, that we can have these conversations and, uh, and, uh, and there's this like, eye to eye, like this, this like very like respect about different, differing opinions. Um, because that is also really missing in this space. Um, so any, any podcast that does that is deserves respect. And and for that, uh, Max, I, you have my, um, undying utmost, uh, respect. Um, and I'll, I'll be sure, uh, I, I know I've invited you to my podcast and you're definitely going to be on there soon, but, um, yeah, as always, like, I think we've only met a couple times in real life, but uh, yeah, you always have my respect. Yeah, thank you very much. And I can very much give that back. Uh, and just to, to summarize, I think this conversation, like the gist of it is, well, trusted third parties are security holes, right? They are much more efficient than decentralized, trustless, censorship resistant systems, right? So that's why we end up using trusted, centralized infrastructure. If you end up needing to use that, well, then make sure that you're at least privacy protected so that that central coordinator has zero knowledge about any information that's going on, right? And then at least there is no targeted censorship uh, or, or surveillance possible. But nevertheless, you always have that black swan risk that the entire thing will just be shut down. And we saw that in real life happening just a couple months ago uh, with Aviv's project uh, as really a hostile takeover, uh, just tackling down a, a company providing a centralized service. And we've seen this in the past with centralized exchanges, just being shut down or well running away with the money. And now we see something like Tether emerging that's the same centralized point of failure but on a colossal scale that spans across multiple exchanges. And uh, that is the trading pair for a huge amount of liquidity in this market. So if that Black Swan event would in fact come down to a halt, well, that would be a very, very dangerous place to be in. So peers, watch out, always verify, uh, and don't use things that you cannot verify or at least use them with a lot of caution. Uh, and well, if you do that, then best is probably just to stick around in Bitcoin and not to go gambling. But Aviv, w one more time, where can the people find you? Yeah, uh, follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm at Milner underscore Aviv. Uh, if you look up Aviv Milner, you'll find me. Uh, the podcast is pretty much everywhere. You know, it's Spotify. It's on Anchor.fm. Uh, on Breeze, you can easily find the the the, the podcast. It's called When the Music Stops. 
Um, and it's, it's entirely focused on, um, just uh, shit talking scams in crypto, um, and discussing where, uh, narratives fail, uh, and, and tether is going to be like, uh, unfortunately it's like a third of the podcast or even a half, um, which might sound boring, but the, the problem is there. Um, so, you know, uh, um, uh, definitely. And like I said, Bennett Tomlin, Caspiancy, uh, David Gerard, um, you know, there, there are, there are a lot of in people who have interesting, um, perspectives that although sometimes are definitely wrong, um, that, that skepticism is healthy, um, because it, it, it pushes back against things like tether. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you again, Max. Uh, yeah. Can, cannot thank you enough. It was a pleasure, Aviv and Piers. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.